after a rainy afternoon in Atlanta. The skies are clearing tonight at Turner Field, and the Braves are back in action. A big crowd filing into Turner Field as we get a second look at home with the Philadelphia Phillies providing the opposition. All year long, Braves baseball is brought to you by our friends at Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. The Braves are 2-2 two two on this homestand. They'll try to even up the series with the Phillies. It's the middle game of three tonight here on Fox. And I again, friends, along with John Smoltz, I'm Chip Carey. John's pinch hitting for my partner, Joe Simpson. He's home resting comfortably after Achilles tendon surgery today. And Joe, everybody in Braves country thinking about you tonight. We hope your recuperation is going well. And heck, John, finally you get a chance to pitch hit, pinch hit in the big leagues. Yeah, and just to be said, Kathy, uh, sorry, you, but you do have a leg up on your husband, Joe. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Yes, indeed. <laughs> You do. Urban Santana gets the ball for the Braves, John. The bullpen has been worked awfully hard. Imagine Urban has a little extra pressure on him tonight facing this Philadelphia ball club because the bullpen's been hit awfully hard. They've worked a lot of overtime innings of late. Yeah, when you go through stretches like this, a, a starter knows very well. He doesn't have to be told his bullpen has worked hard. you got to try to pitch deep into the game. If you can reset a bullpen, whether you win or lose, that goes a long way for the season. This bullpen has exhausted a lot of extra innings, certainly haven't won out of those extra innings, but they need a rest. They do indeed need a rest. The Braves have lost two of their last three comeback attempts. And with that in mind, we saw last night David Carpenter leave the game with a biceps problem. He was placed on the disabled list today, and Pedro Beato came up from Triple A Gwinnett. Yeah, he's going to give him fresh arm. And of course, this guy in his previous time is a big league. He's got a good arm, good slider, and certainly hoping to fill the void of what has been a very tired bullpen. Well, Atlanta hopes to get back into the win column tonight against the Philadelphia Phillies. Kyle Kendrick and Urban Santana are the starting pitchers. We got to get the magic man back. Back on track, and we'll talk about that with you right after this as the Braves and Phillies get set for game two tonight here at Turner Field. Presented by AT&T U-verse, Delta Airlines, and Ford. 
After a late night early morning at Turner Field time to turn around for game two between the Phillies and the Braves as we look to dodge the raindrops tonight and get Atlanta a win in the series. Welcome back to the ballpark. I'm Turner. I'm Tom Hart here at Turner Field where Urban Santana was simply magical in his first handful of starts in his first year as an Atlanta Brave. In fact his very first start against the New York Mets he nearly threw a no hitter over eight innings of work and then he bounced back against the Phillies and he absolutely dominated this Philadelphia ball club. Keep in mind he only worked six innings on April 14th against his Philly team on the road but he struck out 11. He said his stuff that day was better than it's ever been. Yet better even than when he threw a no hitter a few years ago. The key he said I was living at the knees and below with the fastball and the slider. 11 K's against just two walks and one earned run over four hits in that span. But he has yet to regain that form. In fact over the last six starts Urban Santana has an ERA of nearly six and a half with 24 strikeouts against 14 walks. His catcher tonight Jerry Laird is not too concerned. He says the stuff is still the same. That's fine. The boss is good. The slider's sharp. It's just, you know, here and there he'll lose command uh, and won't have his best command. And uh, you know, that tends to hurt you when you try to make a pitch and you just kind of leave something in the middle of the play. He's a veteran guy and he knows what he's got to do and he's going to you know, figure it out and, and fix it quick. He doesn't have to worry about the elevation in Denver. He's back at home and see if Urban Santana can regain that form. Ready for first pitch in just moments. It'll be Carey and Smoltz in the booth. No Simpson. Well, tonight the Braves try to win one for the limper. Phillies and Braves come up next in game two. Atlanta area Mazda dealers. We had a big downpour in downtown Atlanta around 4, 4 15 or so. That snarl traffic on the downtown connector. But as we mentioned earlier, the skies are clearing. It's turned out to be a perfect night for baseball. Marlon Bird anchors the Toyota starting lineup for the visiting Philadelphia Phillies who enter play tonight. Only five and a half games behind the Braves in the National League East. You see what Bird has done at Turner Field. Ryan Howard is a Braves killer too. And John, let's see if Irvin Santana can put his woes of Coors Field behind him. Seems like the Phillies would be a perfect tonic for that. Yeah, you see the numbers in two starts had some success against the Phillies. Of late, he has been in a, in a tough stretch and they're hoping to turn that around in a timely fa fashion as we talked about the bullpen desperately needs a big start. And for the Ford keys for Santana, get to two strikes. 0-2, he has been unhittable. 080 average and command of the slider. Good start as he pumps over a strike for Jimmy Rollins. 
Rollins leading off with Ben Revere getting the night off. You recall Revere made a great catch to rob Freddie Freeman last night and came up limping after the fourth inning. So Ryan Sandberg goes to Rollins first. Revere is off. And quickly Santana does have a two strike count. Yeah good start. Some numbers don't add up when you look at stats and and getting ahead 0 and 1 should fare better than he has a four over a 400 batting average but it dips to that 080 mark with 0 and 2 count. So look for to see how many times he can get to two strikes against the Phillies. Let me ask you this. You pitched at Coors Field. You've made starts after you've pitched at Coors Field. Is there a hangover or a carryover effect from that particular start? Yes, there is. And I'll tell you, it doesn't even have to be pitching in a game. Sometimes your bullpen sessions will allow you to get in a funk because your ball doesn't have the same break, you don't have the same sharpness, and you work harder. So I got to a point in my career where I just didn't throw a bullpen, and I didn't want to get messed up or have that effect carry over to my next start. Ripped down the right field line. Rollins is going to reach on a 1 2 pitch. Hayward played it cleanly, and Jimmy Rollins will stand at second with a leadoff double. Rollins, already the all time Phillies leader in hits, cranks out a leadoff double to start the game tonight. Well, you see right here, this pitch is right over the heart of the plate, and Jimmy Rollins still has enough as he keeps racking up his career stat total. And Starts off with a double almost really where they left off in the 13th inning and getting a lot of runs in a game that was so tightly contested. So Jimmy Rollins has a 12 game hitting streak. He has 12 hits in those 12 games. And he's in scoring position for Carlos Ruiz the Phillies catcher. The Lodzing Ruiz hit second on the lineup card for the Phillies. This is the 12th time he's done it, and he won't advance Rollins with a ground ball to short. One out. So Marlon Bird bats. Marlins knocked in three runs against the Braves this year. As you see, Ryan Sandberg, the Phillies skipper. He replaced Charlie Manuel late last year. This is Ryan's first full season at the helm in Philadelphia. Despite being eight games under 500, amazingly, the Phillies are only five and a half games out of first behind the Braves. Good lead by Rollins at second. Bird was a little late. I would think this next month is as important for an organization in a transition month, meaning are they going to work their way back in it or are they going to be players to send other guys somewhere else? Because this has been an organization that has won until the last couple of years, aging players, big contracts. It's kind of make it or break it, I would think, up until the all-star break for the Phillies. And they kind of luck their way into a division that hasn't been what we thought it was going to be with between the Nationals and the Braves kind of and the Marlins stacked the top. And I think this would be a very tough Phillies team to evaluate. Yes they have a lot of veteran players big offensive threats. But what kind of flexibility John does Ruben Amaro really have with the big contracts and in the case of Ryan Howard who's on deck bad wheels lots of money owed Cliff Lee is hurt big money owed. What can Ruben Amaro do if anything he doesn't have a lot other than if he finds or runs into a couple desperate teams uh, a, a Cliff Lee is a difference maker. He takes you from maybe making the playoffs to making the playoffs and then if you're in the playoffs a potential World Series champion. Did Bird go around he apparently did he's called out at the plate on a check swing. Andy Gonzalez brings up Marlon Bird for the second out of the inning. It's probably the hitter's biggest pet peeve was when the home plate umpire sees the pitch and the swing at the same time. Sometimes it's obvious, but more times than not, a hitter wants the guy to just check down the first base. So Ryan Howard is the hitter, a longtime Braves killer. Howard hit a second inning home run here last night, and it's a no doubter straight away center. Well, how many times are you going to see the splits on Ryan Howard? Where at home he hits absolutely nothing, and on the road he has done his most damage. I mean, that park is conducive for Ryan Howard. 
It almost was built for him. You don't have to have a great deal of power to hit the ball out in left in Philly. You just have to elevate the baseball. We've seen Howard break the Braves hearts with that short porch at Citizens Bank in left field so many times. Last night not a cheapie. And he fouls one at the plate for an even count. So evaluate the Phillies from a player's perspective. Yes, they're five and a half out. Realistically, are they in this thing or are they not in this thing? I mean, realistically, I would say no based on the pitching that has been missing in, in some of the slow starts. Now, Hamels is back on his game, and if they can get Cliff Lee back in there, there's your one-two punch that gives you a real good chance every series. But until they find ways to score some runs, which is really the biggest puzzle, uh, I'm sure for Ryan Sandberg, is the fact that They've still got the names names on a jersey don't always work out for career totals when you start going on the downtrend of your career So they've got to find a way to score runs and then yes there any team who scores runs and gets pitching is in it And you could tell you know financially where they spent their money of course doc Halliday did not pan out to the end of his contract via injury big contract there Cliff Lee Hamels, Papelbon, first baseman, shortstop, and second base. That's your team. That's your core. They have to produce, and injuries have really hurt a lot of them. Howard bounces another ball off his big body and faces a full count. When you think about Utley, one of the premier second basemen, his injury has watered him down to mere mortal instead of superstar like he was going. Those aren't as bad when they bounce. They're still not fun. But Ryan Howard, I think, is the biggest contract that they have found themselves stuck with because he hasn't been able to get back healthy er and relive some of those numbers that he posted pre-contract. There's that shot to left by Howard, and Upton has gone as far as he can go. And Ryan Howard displays the oppo power with a two-run homer. With two outs, it's two nothing Phillies here in the first. Thirteenth home run for Ryan Howard, and his twentieth in his career in this ballpark. Well, and this speaks to just a guy that is strong enough to not try to pull this pitch, maybe beat a little bit with the fastball, but has enough power. To all parts of the field, that's probably 20 rows deep in Citizens Ballpark. This is a, this is a fair park, and you got to hit it, and he did. Now Dominic Brown breaks his bat, and he singles with two outs. Something we have noticed a lot of late with Santana, John. He's getting a lot of the middle of the plate, and the opponents aren't missing. Yeah, and, and you go through stretches like that. Look, I looked at his career numbers, and he's, just, he's so much better in the second half, which is great news for when you go through little streaks in the first half. And he's already defied some of the numbers that he's been really good at. Runners in scoring position, he's stingy. Runners in scoring position, two outs, almost impossible to get a hit off him, and that's exactly what happened here in the first. So when it's going bad, even the great numbers are a little inflated in the adverse way, and certainly Howard took advantage of it. So ball one low to John Mayberry Jr. He's been marvelous off the bench for the Phillies. Tonight he's making his fourth start in center field. For Ryan Sandberg. He's hit five homers and has knocked in 16 men. Santana's front side is interesting from a pitcher. I mean, he has kind of not a violent front side, but his front shoulder is, is clearing the way, and then his right shoulder follows. And when they're off just a just a fraction and you don't have that mechanical crispness, your slider is going to be affected the most. You can get away with some location and fastball with velocity, but you, all of a sudden you think about it, if you're an inch or two off before you throw the ball, you're going to be six to seven inches off when the ball gets across home plate. And so that front side. When it stays quiet, it stays on plane. And when it kind of wants to make the ball move or make the ball do certain things, your front side kind of pulls more and pulls towards first base. <laughs> Maddox used to talk about, or at least I learned from him, his front side, like an imaginary box where he would keep his glove in it. It wouldn't be violent. And then he would come to his glove. So imagine that he would get that front side out there and his front 
his backside would come towards it. A lot of guys get their glove out of the way and actually tuck it, get it in and tuck. There's no wrong way to deliver a pitch. It's just the timing is so crucial. And people at home are trying to figure out, well, he's got bullpens. Why doesn't he work it out in the bullpen? Well, you go through stretches where and when it clicks, it'll click. Another full count coming for John Mayberry here after Ryan Howard has hit a two run homer. Brown leads from first. He'll be running with the pitch. There he goes. And it's taken low by Mayberry. So a long inning for Santana continues. He just threw his 22nd pitch of the opening frame. Now, now the downside as a starting pitcher when you inherently know I got to go deep today. You may be out there longer when things aren't going well than you would typically be. I think Laird's getting a nice situation here to try to get him back in the zone. But I would use this is an unwritten rule I used. If, if it's three in a row, then you've got to look to see what changes you need to make because the league is getting information. If it's just a couple games or one hiccup here or there, you don't pay too much attention to it. But if it starts turning into three games in a row, that means somebody's picking up something and the whether it's pitch selection, mechanics, tipping pitches, or the fact that you're over the middle of the plate more, like we talked about, those then you have to take notice of making some some adjustments. Well, Santana, going back to his start May 16th in St. Louis, has given up five runs or more in four of his last six games. This is an extended stretch for Irvin where he hasn't been particularly sharp. He did pick up the win in Miami on May 31st. That was a 9 5 game, a game that the Braves jumped out to a big lead, and the Marlins just kept chipping and pecking away to make it close late. As Reed Brignac drives one toward right, Hayward's going to catch that. And then, of course, Santana, a good outing in Arizona. Gave up no earned runs, but suffered a no decision on a blown save. It's Greg Maddox bobblehead night. Rough start for the Braves in game two of the series. It's 2 0 Phillies. Run opposite field home run gives Kyle Kendrick an early 2 0 lead as we head to the bottom of the first inning. Here's a look at Freddie Gonzalez's Toyota starting lineup. Justin Upton has had good luck against Kyle Kendrick. Kendrick has not had good luck as a starter, with the exception, John, of his work against the Braves. For some reason, he's had their number and he hopes to have it again. As you see, seven and two in 15 career starts. Yeah, pretty amazing and undefeated here at Turner Field. I think the Kyle Kendrick, in a year that has not gone so well for him, may be looking forward to pitching to a team he's had some success against. The Ford keys for tonight's game is get them through the first. He has given up 15 runs in the first inning and pitched pretty bit, pretty well after that. 
And as we said, he loves pitching here. And he pumps over another strike for Jason Hayward. It's 0-2. I mean, that's hard to think about. 15 runs, and then the rest of the way, you know, it was hard to come up with four innings that he would give up that many runs that he did in the first inning. So starting out of the gate with this guy's sinker is very difficult so far for him this year. And three strikes takes care of Jason Hayward, who is slow to take a right turn. Kendrick, a 48% round ball rate, kept the ball down to Hayward and has out number one. Yeah, you see the sinker that's pretty good, and look at the PNC pitching performance on pitch tracks. That catches the, we call that a front door sinker, what Maddox made so famous here on Greg Maddox Bobble Night. It's got more of those strikeouts than I can even remember. BJ up to the batter and takes a strike. It's funny how one pitcher can have another team's number, no matter how well or how poorly he's pitching. In the last 24 starts made by Kyle Kendrick, he's 4 and 13. 4 and 13. But as a starter against the Braves, he's 6 and 2. Go figure. Now, the caveat to that, it, it, one of the, if I could throw in one more key under the Ford keys score me some runs please yeah. they have not scored yeah. him hardly any runs in that stretch and the only games that he's won this year they've been able to score him six or more runs not that it takes six to win a baseball game but he has not been he just struck out Upton over the outside corner and he has a parting shot for Manny Gonzalez and another parting shot too close to take and Upton is out number two. Well, one of the things that he's going to talk about is the catcher setting so far off, but you see the late movement. Normally you won't get that call if the catcher's too far off of the strike zone area, but because of the late movement, you know, Justin's got a little beef there about the widening of the plate in the sense that where he set up and where that ball actually was caught. Two quick outs for Freddie Freeman. He jumps all over the first pitch and rips one to a right center field. Looks like Freddie Freeman is back, folks. We have not seen Freddie jump on many first pitches over the last couple of weeks. But after a big night at the plate last night, he rips a double to right center field with two outs. Well, Freddie's a product of seeing nothing but sinkers and all strikes so far. So he said, what the heck? I'm going to go up there looking to... Do some damage in that. He did. The ball bounces. Robbed him of a triple, Chip. I think that might have been a triple. If a couple guys fell down, he might, might have, have got there. He might have been robbed of an inside the park homer last night. Remember, Dominic Brown thought the ball left the park, hit off the yellow line, and ricocheted back toward the infield. Luckily for the Phillies, Ben Revere backed up the play. Otherwise, Freeman might have circled the bases and scored on an inside the park homer in the 10th inning. I can't believe you're calling out Freddie Freeman's speed like that, man. Come on. <laughs> we take a look at our Georgia Lottery hitting the jackpot with Justin in the batter's box. He's a long strider. He gets a lot of things done with each stride. Distance-wise. Yes. <laughs> oh, and one that count for Upton. And that ball sunk. And it's quickly 0-2. One more quick note on Freeman. Four hits in the series now, three of them for extra bases. That is a sight for sore eyes for the Braves. Let's see if Justin can bring him around with a two out hit. Two strikes. I would have thought that this would be a fairly good matchup for Justin because the ball's coming back to him. He, you really need to sweep the ball away and stay away from the middle part of the plate where he does so much damage and obviously loves hitting at home. John, this is a classic example of strength versus strength. Kendrick likes to keep the ball down. Justin likes to hit the ball down. Yeah, and and sometimes you just have to be better. If you're a pitcher that's pitching to a strength of a hitter, you can't abandon your strength. You just have to try to be better. And 
Uh, I'll share an example of this at bat last longer in my first year in a scouting report given to these Philadelphia Phillies Juan Samuel. Roller to the left side. Rollins plays it to the side and goes to first and Howard gets up to Boy, every time Howard catches the ball at first, it looks like that foot comes off the bag. And Freddy Gonzalez may come out and ask for a second look from first base umpire Brian Knight. Yeah, this was a real close play. And when there's last out is made, they're encouraging the managers to get out there in a timely manner so that the players don't leave the field. And when I first saw it, I thought he was safe. Jimmy Rollins got a still a good enough arm, but you can see the stride isn't he never really strides to catch the ball at first base. He lets the ball almost come into him. See how he's a Ooh, it's going to be awfully close depending on the looks they get and the rule is there has to be clear and convincing evidence to overturn the call don't know that there's enough there for Freddy Gonzalez to challenge the call and apparently he is not going to so Jimmy Rollins gets Justin Upton on a bang bang play at first not much of a stretch for Ryan Howard and Kendrick is through the first inning with a two run lead. Toyota. It's 2 nothing Phillies as we move to the second inning. And Braves fans, this is your last chance to enter for a chance to win round trip airfare. Any place Delta flies in the continental U.S., two nights hotel accommodations, and $250 spending cash. It's the Delta Day Contest. Enter on your mobile devices or computer at foxsports.com slash south slash Delta. We'll announce the winner later on tonight so good luck you have until the third inning to enter our Delta Day flyaway contest here's Cesar Hernandez he's in for Chase Utley tonight and a comebacker right back through the middle that's four hits already for the Phillies So much for the early success of getting to 0 and 2. He's had two now hitters 0 and 2, and unfortunately he's let him get away with hits. And that's the worst kind of hit because 0 2 to eighth hitter, the pitcher now gets to bunt, and that is uh, that's like giving the pitcher something free to do. When you have this part of the lineup, you want to make sure that you can not have to have this kind of situation happen. Kedrick as a bunter. Let's just say he's a good pitcher. He struck out 10 times and he sacrificed once. Yeah, that, that's that's a tough one there. That, that's got to be uh, something you can work on to get a little better at least. So maybe he's still grinding at it. I can tell you initially. Sometimes. 
the way you stand and the mechanics of bunting is just as important as actually getting the button down because if you're not in position he's right on top of the plate depending on where his weight is and what he's doing with that bat. I know Joe's talked about this a lot the way that as you just said the way pitchers position themselves to bunt didn't used to be that way 15 20 30 years ago. No. You know, and again, I hate to harbor this point, but it really is one of the easiest things to do once you get the fundamentals down. Once somebody shows you something that clicks, you go, oh, I'm not up there sweating so much to try to get a bunt down. Now he's got to try to do it with two strikes. Hernandez is running the pitch in the dirt. The throw to second is in time. What a throw by Laird to take care of Hernandez. That's a big pick me up you'd think that's unbelievable there picking on a slider thinking that the pitcher was just concentrating on the hitter. This is a great throw and a great tag. If he doesn't get him there he's safe. Got him right on top of the helmet. So Kendrick couldn't bunt and he couldn't pull the trigger on that pitch and is struck out. So a promising inning. Now quickly two outs and back to the top of the order. So to finish the topic I was going to go to Juan Samuel scouting report dead fastball hitter first hitter of the game. I'm a fastball pitcher right. I'm done in my mind. What do I do. So I proceed to throw seven sliders in a row and the seventh one he hits for a leadoff home run and when I get back in the inning they're, they're all over me like what are you doing. And I said he's a dead fastball hitter. That's what you guys said in the scouting report. He said, they said that doesn't mean you can't throw him one. After seven sliders, it gets pretty easy to hit the seventh one. Lesson learned, never happened again. If I knew a guy was a dead fastball hitter, it didn't bother me as much after learning that uh, small example. Two outs for Rollins, who doubled and scored ahead of the Howard Homer in the first. That, I guess, would be a classic example, John, of paralysis by analysis, right? Yeah, there's no doubt. And, and a lot of people give hitters too much credit in their scouting reports. That's why I didn't like them as much as some people. Hitters, that is, or scouting reports, <laughs> both. <laughs> <laughs> nice work by Santana with a little help from Gerald Laird. He's out of the second. It's a 2 0 Phillies game. Cox was shown on the high definition scoreboard in straightaway center field. There he is. Bobby looks great. That's amazing. Uh, his transition, uh, I got to give him credit. I don't know what the behind the scenes are like, but he looks like he's doing okay. I thought that was a man that, uh, away from the game, might not enjoy it as much. What a summer for him and Tommy and. Greg Maddox. Yeah, it's really it's going to be an incredible Georgia Atlanta theme. You think about the big hurt is going in. He's from Georgia. Joe Torrey spent some time here. And then Tony LaRusso. And of course the Hall of Fame induction ceremonies in Cooperstown. A definite Braves flavor in 2014. 
As we go to work in the second inning, Tommy LaStella, Chris Johnson, and Andrelton Simmons are coming up. This young man has had quite a first couple of weeks in the big leagues. Tommy LaStella has played in 17 games this year. But he's fourth among National League rookies in hits, tied for third in multi hit games. He's sixth in walks, and he's ninth in total bases. Yeah, it, it, you know, the chicken and the egg. You know, who makes the adjustment first? Who who finds out who? And a, a, a pitcher, when he sees a guy he's never had any information on, it's difficult. And the adjustments in this game are at times monumental because once I, you know, once they find something, when I say they, the whole league, pitchers, video, they're going to expose it until that hitter makes the adjustment. And when a hitter can make an adjustment and show that that door is locked, it's a nice, nice transition coming from the minor leagues. So and, and he has done a nice job at basically just barreling line drives. I mean, it's impressive. So who has the advantage? I mean, did you ever feel like the hitter had the advantage over you or vice versa when you saw somebody for the first time? I always felt that the hitter had an advantage slightly only because I had no clue. Like, I really didn't. We, we, we had a team where not a lot of guys came from the minors. That ball's barreled out to second, and Hernandez with a catch to his right takes care of Lestella for the first out. But this game becomes like a fraternity of, all right, it's just who I'll guess is who. Once you know and have a track record, certainly as we watch this line drive again be hit, you try to find in-game different spots to go to and see, because there's so much technology. You're, you're seeing video replays of every hitter, every swing, every pitch they take, and... What I miss most is the cat and mouse game of trying to figure out who's thinking what and how do you outthink the person that's at the plate trying to obviously get a hit. Chris Johnson's the batter at 276 and a bouncing ball to short. Sunday hop for Rollins. He stayed with it. Low that's throw and Howard digs it out. And that's the second out of the inning. Was talking with Greg Walker about that very point before the game. Greg had an interesting thought. He really believes that right now, with the technology in the game, that the pitchers and pitching coaches have a leg up on the offenses. And he thinks that's why one reason why offense is down all across Major League Baseball. The ability of pitching coaches and pitchers to execute their pitches. His point is it's easier to execute a pitch than it is to hit a well executed pitch. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, you, you certainly can have moments where you can tell a pitcher or a hitter what's coming and you execute your pitch. You you're going to beat most hitters. And I think with the ever changing amount of pitchers per game that also adds to the inability to get locked in as a hitter. You're not facing a pitcher three and four times too many times. And I think that's why I kind of laugh at today's philosophy of work the count, work the count, work the pitches. No, you shouldn't be. If you're not going to see that guy but six innings, you better take advantage of it and do the damage you can because later the arms coming out of the pen aren't going to make it that much easier for you. Yeah, everybody's throwing 95, right? Yeah. Strike one to Simmons. And he takes one over the outside corner. Manny Gonzalez is hunting strikes behind the plate. I like it. He sure is. And if you're a hitter in tonight's game, already by the early advance from some of the previous hitters, swing the bat. Get ready to swing the bat. Hunt for a pitch and go get it. Bouncing ball towards second. Hernandez charged and made a good play. Round ball outs piling up now for Kyle Kendrick. He's got three of them in the game and he leads by two after two.
5G. And AT&T, mobilizing your world. It's 2 nothing Phillies. We head to the top of our third inning. We'd like to give a hearty welcome to a group of self-proclaimed die-hard Braves fans from Fast Eddie's Sports Cafe in Ackworth, Georgia. Fast Eddie's arrived to the game tonight on the Fox Sports Fan Express. This is their first outing, and we hope to see them back very soon. The Fan Express is a complimentary way to travel to Turner Field, courtesy of Fox Sports, when you buy a Braves Fan Express group ticket package. You, too, can travel like a VIP to and from the ballpark aboard the Fox Sports Fan Express. Book yours today at Braves.com slash Fan Express. You know who's on an express right now? The Kansas City Royals. They're jumping all over the Tigers again, looking for their ninth win in a row. Up 7 nothing on Max Scherzer. After they put a bunch of runs on Justin Verlander last night. Oh, my. Ned's got his group hot. If KC wins that game. They'll take over first in the American League Central. Maybe they've figured things out in middle America with the Royals. I think they're on their fifth hitting coach in three years. This time it's Dale Swain. The former Brewers and Cubs manager. Scherzer's given up two home runs and one and a third. Seven hits. Do you think that contract has a gauge or barometer or teeter-totter as the year goes on? Or? Uh, man, oh man. Hayward. In right field will track down Ruiz's fly ball. And Carlos Ruiz is 0 for 2. I think his turning down that deal raised a lot of eyebrows. <laughs> Some of my hair fell out, and I don't have much left of that to happen. But uh, we'll see what happens as it plays out. That's a lot of money, and certainly he uh, is getting advised to deal with the, the route that he wants to go about. He's betting on himself. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. No. Nope. But a rough night for Max Scherzer, it appears tonight, as the Tigers trailing the Royals 7 0. There's Marlon Bird. Bird was called out on a check swing his first time up. Well, I really believe the trend's going to eventually re reverse itself a little bit with some of the contracts pitcher wise. I think it's too long in some of the cases, and you're going to see that have to come back to maybe five years being the max. When you start doling out seven eight year contracts to a starting pitcher with all that we're dealing with today you're, you're rolling you're truly rolling the dice one ball one strike this is empty for bird you know I got a lot of time on my hands right like or I should say I come up with a lot of goofy stuff you think yeah, yeah right no. sure in honor of our wounded Joe Simpson S be in the case Simpson left side Simmons to first another S case well I, I've come up with the all alphabet team where I'm looking for starting pitchers in the S category Santana certainly qualifies okay some of the names Strasburg Scherzer tonight we talked about right sale Samarja Shields you get the point then on the other side you know you got the K Kendrick Kazmir Keifel Kluber Kershaw Eight-year deal. So feel free to feel free to play along at home with your notepad. And it's going to get tough when you start getting to the B's, the W's, and <laughs> <laughs> you do have a lot of time. Yeah, guys. yeah, I well, do. You, what do we say? The uh, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. So <laughs> we'll keep John busy tonight and again tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. And then Paul Bird is going to join us for the road trip. That's right. Paul will pitch it for Joe, who again is back home here in Atlanta, recovering from Achilles tendon surgery. Everything went well. Joe's so thankful and grateful for everyone's thoughts and well wishes tonight. Joe's hoping to come back maybe by the end of the road trip in Philadelphia. But more likely when we get back from the road trip. I, I thought it was a little much uh, for the crew today to break one of the the chair is put out and one of the wheels is off the chair which I didn't think was appropriate. <laughs> not, not right in my mind. Well Dave Baker said we had the missing broadcaster formation <laughs> before the game. The empty chair. 
Joe from Oklahoma. They make him tough there. He'll be back in no time. And Kathy, we're really, really sorry. Did he go? He did not. Two balls, two strikes for Ryan Howard. He beat the judge. Of course, the home umpire did not make the call this time. Rip toward right center. Long run Hayward. He says he's got it, and he does. Three up, three down for Santana. He'll take matters into his own hands. He's due second in the third with the Phillies up early. Inning trailing by two early in Atlanta. Fans for a limited time purchase $200 or more on player merchandise from the Rams Clubhouse store at CNN Center, and you'll get a free autographed baseball while supplies last. For more details, stop by the Braves Clubhouse store at CNN Center or call 404 523 5854. Laird Santana and Hayward versus Kyle Kendrick. As John mentioned, 15 first inning runs allowed by Kendrick this year. None tonight. Stake to an early lead. And cute back to the screen. It's nothing in two. Well, so far he's doing everything he needs to do to be successful. When he's behind in the count, the hitters are having a field day, and he hasn't been behind the count too many times. He's pouring in strikes. He's putting the hitters on notice on both sides of the plate with his sinker. He's had good command. He's mixing in a slider and an occasional changeup. And like guys who have a good sinker chip, the one thing he does with his foot is he pitches off the first base side of the rubber. So it creates that leverage and angle that he wants. He starts it with the middle. Up his foot in the middle of the rubber and then slides it over. You see this little move right here, just slides it over to the position he wants. Rollins, it's short. The infield's been busy for the Phillies tonight. That's how you expect them to be if Kendrick is right, and sadly, he is so far. One out. Yeah, and one of the things that makes it comfortable for uh, is the timing in the delivery. You see kind of like a little two step, and then he slides it over into position. And then goes right on line. He's going to be real good to that side of the plate because that's where the ball comes back. He can make it look like a ball and come back over the plate. You mentioned run support. A big problem for Kendrick so far this year. He's allowed three runs or less in eight of his 14 starts, yet he's only won two games. With any kind of offensive help, this guy might be six and two and not two and six. 
And just to give you an indication, the freedom of when you get some runs, he's got a 1-4-7 ERA when they score him some runs, when they score six plus runs. And it gets a little difficult when you're in always in a tight game trying to pitch perfect with a guy that doesn't strike out a lot of guys. He relies on contact, those ground balls. He's got one of the higher rate race shows for ground ball outs because that sinker is so late. The hitter just kind of hits the top half of the ball and of course drives it into the ground. Santana's down on strikes and quickly two are out in the Atlanta third approaching eight o'clock Eastern time. Philly's got a two run homer from Ryan Howard. In the opening inning, it came with two outs. Second homer of the series for the Phillies' first baseman. Yeah, it looked like there for a while last night. That's all they needed was that one home run. Cole Hamels pitched great, and then the Braves came back and, of course, do what you got to do. At least tie it up, and then send, send it into extra innings. And you like your chances the longer the game goes for a home team, but it did not pan out in the 13th. Hayward was retired on three pitches to start the ball game. Everything Kendrick threw him moved. It darted in, out, and down. And he's ahead of him here with two outs. Brave start play tonight. A half game ahead of Washington, a game ahead of Miami. Both of those rivals are in action tonight. Washington leads Houston 2 0 in the third inning. The Cubs are leading Miami 3 to 1. The Cubs are playing a lot better of late. We'll follow those scores all night long for you. Collarbone high, two balls, two strikes. Give you an example of what we talked about with Kyle Kendrick coming into this game. He had not had the lead very often. He's got a 4-0 ADRA when leading. Only 17 innings so far in the year that he's been leading. 40 of those he's been behind and 23 have been tied. 17 of 84 innings he's led. And that includes tonight's work as Hayward rips one toward right center field. That's going to get down. For an extra base hit. Look at Hayward fly around the bags. He'll stop at second with two outs. Tenth double for Hayward. And his second hit of the year against the Phillies pitching staff. Jason did a nice job right here. You see it's supposed to be a front door sinker, and he does a nice job keeping the barrel and everything right behind, pulling his hands in. He didn't have to pull them in as far because the ball caught more of the plate. I would anticipate BJ being a little more aggressive now after the first plate appearance where everything was called a strike on him. Drill toward left. It's going to get down for a hit. Hayward around third. He's going to get a late stop sign and wisely held up. He would have been toast at the plate. Nice play by Brown to get the ball quickly back to the infield. And B.J. Upton has a hit. And that will bring up Freddie Freeman who jumped all over the first pitch he saw tonight. Yeah, you can almost feel this as a pitcher, and that's why he went to the slider, but the slider didn't move. You see right there, it stayed right over the middle of the plate. You can anticipate sometimes when you feel like a hitter who took three pitches is going to probably be more aggressive. He went with the right pitch. He just didn't execute it. And, of course, B.J. did a nice job in attacking it. Freddie Freeman has eight RBIs in his last 25 games. A chance for him to do some two out damage. And now 
outside ball one. Four game hitting streak now for Freeman. He has seven hits in his last 16 at bats. There, a backdoor cutter. Yank foul past Terry Pendleton. He got away with one there. Tried to go away with a change up off speed pitch, and that ball sat right over the middle of the plate. Freddie doesn't miss too many of those, keeping him fair. Kendrick ready now with a one two pitch. And Freeman hits it in the air to right. But that's going to be playable for Marlon Bird, and Kendrick is out of third inning trouble. A double and a single come for Atlanta with two outs, but nothing comes of that rally. And we head to the fourth inning. The Braves' offensive frustrations continue tonight against Kyle Kendrick. It's a two nothing Phillies game. what turned out to be a, a very very sad day for baseball fans everywhere Tony Gwynn the legendary face of the San Diego Padres franchise passed away from cancer at the age of 54 years old we talked a lot about how Tony Gwynn's remarkable career uh, took place in San Diego the wonderful friendships he made the incredible success he had hitting against the Braves big three of Smoltz Maddox and Glavin and John can't imagine what the baseball players fraternity feels like the day after the uh, most untimely passing of Tony Gwynn today. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, we know life is precious and, and doesn't last forever, but when you leave when a great player of an ambassador of the game leaves too early, it, it saddens you. I mean, I can't think of a superstar and maybe he was a little underappreciated from a superstar standpoint because he wasn't arrogant and he was one of the greatest class guy with humility and great at what he did probably the single best hitter I've ever seen and he always shared that smile and I think the reason people loved him not only because he was genuine and, and humility was he wasn't the prototypical like athlete he didn't have that studly body but yet he was great at what he did he could steal he could play defense and obviously he could hit and and the thing that that I admired the most about him was just even talking to him you know, he wasn't, he didn't ever consider himself like in a league of his own. He was willing to share that knowledge and be able to talk baseball and hitting to anybody. And I always used to rib him a little bit. The last couple of years, seen him at some card shows. I had a chance to throw a no hitter in San Diego. Well, as a matter of fact, it probably would have been no hitter. It was the only hit I gave up. 
Tony Gwynn hit a fly ball to left field that Ryan tracked down and got in his glove and dropped. And, and I was just sure it was an error. Oh, guarantee it was an error. I turned around, double. Well, of course, they weren't going to change it. And I lost the bid at a no hitter. And I tell him all the time, you think one less hit was going to matter in your <laughs> Hall of Fame career? <laughs> and he used to laugh because, you know, it was a hit granted to Tony Gwynn. Right. I mean, anybody else, it, it, it would have been an error. You guys obviously take great pride in getting out good hitters. Yeah. When you look at your head to head numbers against Tony yeah. Gwynn, I would imagine you feel pretty good that you were able to hold him down the way I you guess. did. I mean, Man, we're not talking about small sample size. Yeah. You know, sometimes 30 hits, that's a lot in, in 64 at bats. And I tried everything. I even threw knuckleballs. I really did. I tried everything I could. And if I'd have gone back in time and had to do it all over again, I'd have thrown the pitch right down the middle. Really? Yeah, because what he was so good at is he recognized anything you were trying to do, and he saw it quicker than anybody else. And so if you threw it in, he pulled it, in, you know, down the line. If you threw it away, he hit it. And he just was a master of taking what you delivered and using it for his advantage. So I would have thrown it right down the middle, and I think he would have been confused sometimes. Like, what do I do with this pitch? Because nobody would ever think about throwing a pitch right down the middle to Tony Wynn. Was he the toughest out in your Yeah, I, people ask me all the time. I, I'd rather face... Way more people with the bases loaded than Tony Gwynn because I knew I wasn't striking him out. And I was pretty much thought of myself as a strikeout pitcher. So when you can't strike somebody out, you've eliminated options. And that means he's going to put it in play at the most opportunistic time to drive in a run. And that's what he was so good at. And we, we've talked a lot and reading the stories about Tony Gwynn yesterday and again today, we've all talked about how great an offensive player he was. We forget how good an all-around player he was in his younger days. He could really run. Yeah, he was a terrific defensive outfielder. Didn't have the strongest arm, but positioned himself well. Always set well to throw the baseball back to the infield or to try to gun out base runs. I mean, he was a complete five-tool player. Yeah, whatever he lacked, he made up with instinct. He made up with doing and and playing the game right. And. Look, uh, we're going to miss his smile. We're going to miss his genuineness today. The era of baseball is a little bit different. He, I don't think, even with all the social networking that goes on today, he would be in all kinds of commercials and doing all kinds of things. He was just a, a, a gentle giant in his in his position. And uh, th there was a thrill pitching against him, even though the results were not good. Well, they were good for him. Yeah, they sure were. I <laughs> fell back. And out of play by John Mayberry Jr. The sad thing is I don't even remember the one strikeout. Like, if you strike somebody out only once in that many a play appearance, you'd think that would be etched in your right. mind. I don't have a clue. Was, uh, we'll see if Dave can look it up. Your one hitter, April 14th, 1996. Eight innings, one hit. That was the Gwynn play. One walk and 13 strikeouts. Maybe, maybe that was the game. It was the game. When people ask me, have you thrown a no-hitter in the big leagues? I said, yes. And then they look it up and they say, we don't see it. That's because I got robbed <laughs> by the official score. Uh, but it was certainly, uh, you know, I can remember that game vividly because I do not remember more than one or two games where he went hitless, like over with a couple walks, over for 1, over for 2. But I will tell you this, back in the early days when Gerald Perry was trying to become the batting crown champion. That just missed. Big strike zone most of the night. Santana thought he got squeezed there by Manny Gonzalez. It's 2-2. Two and two. I don't remember the year, but Tony Gwynn started the first half and it was one of the worst first halves he's ever had. He was in the 200s. He had, I think, at some point, 70 points behind Gerald Perry. And Gerald would come on the bus. Mayberry pops to short. That'll be an easy play for Simmons. He'll drift back. And he thinks about throwing it first, but Brown's wise to that act. One on, one out. He'd come on the bus, he'd get the megaphone, he'd plead with all the pitchers, would one of you guys please get out Tony Gwynn in the second half because he made this incredible charge. And we can remember being nervous. We want to help our teammate out with young pitchers. We're not very good, you know, as far as the team record was. And here comes like a thoroughbred. You could just see Tony coming. I think he hit four something in the second half. And he caught him. He chased him down, and we <laughs> felt bad. We're like, sorry, <laughs> Gerald. And then at some point, I think a pitcher got brave enough to say, hey, you might think about wanting to get a few hits <laughs> instead of us <laughs> always trying to get him out. How'd that go over? <laughs> it did go over very well. <laughs> oh, man. Reed Brignac is the batter. Yeah, we had a stat last night about Gwynn. 9,000 some odd at bats in the big leagues, and he struck out a little more than 400 times. Seriously, that's three years' worth of the modern-day slugger today. 
Yeah. Three years guys are striking out in that that many yeah. times. 9,288 official at bats. He struck out 434 times. I mean, truly a throwback player. I mean, you talk about guys like Stan Musial, or Joe DiMaggio, or Ted Williams, who almost never struck out. Tony Gwynn's a guy that could have certainly played and starred in that era too. Yeah, it, it, and he didn't, you know, he didn't have the biggest barrel bat. By the way, that's the, not the reason why he made contact. He felt like he had a tennis racket at the plate. He really could cover the zone and spray the ball. And I, I think the the master of a great hitter is he fouls off the great pitches. He didn't put those in play. Brignac tries to split the gap in left center field, and he will. BJ is over, cuts it off, throw coming towards second. It's cut off by Simmons. It gets away from La Stella, and all hands are safe for the Phillies. Runners at second and third with one out. A walk, a pop out, and now Brignac splits a gap in left for the fifth Phillies hit. Oh, they're trying to bury a slider in, and what that's supposed to do is go down towards his back foot and actually backing up, and that's some of the traits of when you're struggling with your slider. Maybe he's trying to cut that one more in, but it backed up, and the hitter did a nice job by splitting the gap. The relay was just a little bit off, or that's the reason why Simmons had to cut the ball and not a direct throw into second. Hernandez hit a comebacker for a leadoff single in the second and was thrown out trying to steal. Braves have the infield in as the eighth place hitter swings and misses with strike one. And this is a perfect classic case where the eighth hitter is the hardest position to hit in the National League. You know that the pitcher's pitching around you because the pitcher's on deck. You try to pitch away from contact, use pitches underneath the barrel, up, down, out. Try not to give in. And it becomes a mental game for who's going to give in first. And the hitter sometimes aggressiveness, aggressiveness will allow the pitcher to never throw a strike. And then sometimes the eighth hole hitter will wait it out and get a pitch to hit and then be able to drive in a run because we, we've already documented the guy on deck does not have a lot of average in his category for a pitcher. One ball, one strike. That one got through Lair. Here comes Brown, and the flip to the plate is going to be late. Well, the last three or four games, we have seen the ball squirt through the legs of Braves catchers. This one scored a wild pitch. Lair got a piece of it, but could not hang on. Here's a replay. Yeah, this this should not be a wild pitch. Uh, this ball hits him in the glove, and I don't know what whether there was a cross up or not, but this ball right here has got to be caught. And I think they just changed it to a pass ball, so that was the right call. So the infield in Hernandez tries to punt and it's foul. And the count two and two. Now what Hernandez is trying to do there is drag that ball to the first base. The runner has to read the play. It's an indefensible play when done right. Now an easier version of that is a right-handed batter pushing to Freeman. So in that situation, they know that this is a potential play that the hitter could put on, and you have to read it. It's not a squeeze. It's a safety. Two-strike pitch, fly ball, shallow center. That's going to drop in front of Upton. He tries to deke. His throw to the plate's going to be off target. And Hernandez into second on the throw. It is a 4 nothing game. And that's a bad read there by, uh, unfortunately, BJ. He really did not have. He, you look at when your center fielder's coming in, you know he can't catch it. It looks like he may have a shot at the plate. And unfortunately, that throw allows the runner to go to second. You can take a chance because the pitcher's on deck, but fundamentally, this ball's got to be down in case you can cut it. And he thinks he can make that throw and possibly get him out. But the chances of that, you got to know the guy at third, and it, it just weren't a high percentage. And the only reason it's not the end of the world is because the pitcher is up. And more than likely, if he is at first, he's going to bunt him to second, or try to at least. So how about Kendrick stake to a four run lead now this is as rare an opportunity as he's had all year for the Phillies and that got a piece of Gerald Laird maybe on the on the bare hand and he'll need a moment to gather himself ouch. 
A lot of hitters will tuck, or a lot of catchers will tuck that hand. You see him try to get it out of the way. Will tuck that hand behind them for this very reason. Because when the ball changes direction, you're going at the glove to think where it is, and of course the deflection takes it where you don't want it to. And that hand is exposed. That's why a lot of catchers will put that hand in a fist formation behind their back or butt or behind the crease of their knee just to keep that from being hit. Nothing in two. And this time Kendrick's <laughs> down on strikes. This time he had it behind his back. Yeah. <laughs> Four strikeouts for Santana. He's gotten Kendrick twice. Laser Baker found it for us. He's got to protect it. You've got to go all the way back to August 2nd, 1988. Tony Gwynn took a called third strike in the sixth inning of a game. You lost four to one. Did they send the umpire down after that? <laughs> Because that rarely happens. I mean, I think that's worth five. If you could get Tony Gwynn looking, looking, that's got to be worth more than just one. Here's Rollins with two outs. And it's popped back on the plate. You know, you have to live the rest of your life knowing that Glav got him twice oh. and only got him once. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. The last name has not stopped either. Tony Gwynn Jr. Broke up the streak I had in St. Louis. I had struck out seven games, seven guys in a row. It was a franchise record for them. And the guy that got the hit, his son, I saw the name and flipped out. Ground ball to first, Santana to the bag. And that will end the Phillies' fourth. They cash in a couple of more runs, a leadoff walk, a pass ball, a double, and an RBI hit makes it 4 0 Phillies. Turner Field. I'm Tom Hart. Where earlier the guys were talking about Tommy Lastella and batting against this league and getting a book on him, where he now has a seven-game hit streak going. He's up second in this inning, and he says pitchers' approaches to him haven't changed one bit since he's been in the bigs. I think I've seen a little bit of everything. Um, there's been, you know, pitching inside, soft stuff away. I think it's been, a, you know, pretty even mixture of, of uh, you know, off-speed and fastballs to both sides of the plate. Perhaps we have the proof. He's playing in his seventh series, and in the previous six, the final game that he played in, he's got nine hits. He's hitting 428 when he faces a team once they have a book on him. That book is all written by Tommy Lasella so far. He's up after Justin Upton. Thank you, Tom. Nice report. A lot of talk the other day about where Tommy Lasella might be hitting in the Braves lineup in the days and weeks ahead. As Justin Upton skies one out of play foul. He keeps swinging a hot bat. He's moved up two spots in the order tonight. He's batting fifth behind Justin Upton. On a night when Evan Gaddis has the evening off, in all likelihood Gaddis will catch tomorrow's 12 o'clock start. No balls and a strike for Upton. It's now even at one and one. 
A lot of folks wondered if Listella would be an ideal number two hitter on this club. Freddy Gonzalez talked about that the other day. And if you look strictly at the numbers, you'd say, well, absolutely. Guy gets on base a lot, doesn't strike out, makes good contact, line drive hitter. All of that's true. But as the lineup is currently constructed, if you have Hayward leading off and Freeman hitting third, you'd have three left-handed bats at the top of your batting order. Justin rifles one toward left, and that's going to be caught by Dominic Brown, one out. Well, and, and people at home don't always understand what's the big deal. I mean, the leadoff hitter only hits once. Uh, the lineup is what it is. So there's certain truth to that. I mean, your leadoff hitter may never lead off past the first inning, but when, when a formula works, and when you don't give the other manager an easier opportunity to manage the game, and you create problems with your lineup, that's when it's a feared situation. Ideally, as Listella digs in, you have a lineup where you can go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, all the way up and down your starting eight. The Braves don't have that kind of luxury the way the club's constructed right now. One ball, no strikes for Tommy. Yeah, the rare switch hitter combination of having a few of those in your lineup certainly makes life a lot easier when you've got a couple guys that can turn around and do damage on both sides of the plate or hit with average. Lestella flips the ball out toward Brown and left. He'll gallop over and make the play. And that's out number two. New for 2014, the Braves will host a kids' baseball clinic for kids of all abilities at Turner Field Monday, June 23rd. It's from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Learn the game from Braves legends Marquise Grissom, Brian Jordan, and Charlie Liebrandt. Great to see Charlie at the ballpark. To reserve your spot for your child today, visit Braves.com slash Kids Clinic. That's Monday, June 23rd, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Speaking of Charlie, his son was drafted, I believe, in the sixth round by the Phillies. Nice stint with Florida State. Now, following the steps of Hopefully is that Paul Bird's son was signed too. Was he not or drafted? Drafted. He's going to attend LSU. Let's say drafted, not signed. He's going to follow the the footsteps of of his dad as well over in college. One ball, one strike for Chris Johnson. No runs, three hits for the Braves. All three hits have come with two outs. And a little low, ball two. Again, a look at the PNC pitching performance on pitch track, see where this ball was. Little low, close to catching. You can do what this guy's doing tonight. You can win anywhere, right? Yeah, I mean, he is, uh, again, for whatever reason, the release point has been more consistent. The pitches are down. He doesn't stay in one area and he double up too many times. Another ground ball. That kicks off the mound. Nice play, Hernandez. What a play. Crazy spin and a funny bounce off the mound. And Kendrick got some good range, good speed, and a good arm from Hernandez to get Chris Johnson in a one, two, three, home fourth. Chase Utley not in the lineup. And Hernandez, what a night defensively. Four-nothing Phillies.
head to the top of the fifth inning. It's time for you to tweet your photo using hashtag South Fan Photo for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming broadcast. That's brought to you by AT&T. Tom Hart, John Smoltz, Chip Carey from Turner Field as Carlos Ruiz pops one back. And John was ready to make the play, but it's out of reach. We got a net up here. Now. Well, we might be able to use it now because, you know, Joe doesn't like the net. But this is our chance to use it. Foul. Foul's going to go get fishing <laughs> one ball one strike hey our job is to make the analyst happy John so here you go here's your chance I mean, we know that no matter if I change a few things while uh... <laughs> <laughs> there we go all right got the net ready well, you're gonna man the net don't I'm gonna man it don't yeah. knock the net out no this has disaster written all no, over. no you're in good hands oh yeah the line drive to left. That's what you said in Boston. Is Ruiz <laughs> hammers one toward left, and he'll slide in safely with a leadoff double. One, two, three, four out of five innings. The Phillies have put the leadoff man on tonight. Well, it's not because Santana's not getting ahead of the hitters. 16 of the first 20, he's thrown strike one, but he just hasn't had that put away pitch or the ability to. Keep the hitters guessing even with the 0 2 counts. He's had some lack of success in the result of one he had 0 2 early on 0 2 five times, two hits with three K's. Marlon Bird, the batter, he'll try to move Ruiz around. This is why I worry about. Yeah, this wasn't fair, by the way. The net. This, this was a. Really small booth and a pinpoint shot off the corner. I mean, I got I got deked by uh, Brian Anderson. I, I I didn't. I had to pull back because it looked like he it looked like he had it. You know. I mean, what does a man do? But take it and call the rest of the game. <laughs> this would have been helpful. You might want to have it right <laughs> this here. This would have been helpful. Now, you know who used to use the net all the time? Ernie Johnson Sr., right? At the old ballpark. Yeah. Indeed he did. Well, we sure miss Ernie Sr. Two balls and a strike. From Irvin Santana to Marlon Bird. Irvin up to 84 pitches in the game. Down four nothing. As we said, five runs has been a repeat occurrence for Santana. Five or more, four times in the last six games he's pitched. He's allowed four so far tonight. Those are the type sliders that we're used to seeing, especially when he's got put away counts. And some of them have not broke consistently enough to get the hitter to think it's a fastball. Bird barely checked his swing. Not so sure you did on that one. No. Howard's on deck. Bouncing ball back to the mound. Good play by Santana to freeze Ruiz at second base. That helps. That's the difference between a man on third and uh, even though it looked like Costello was going to be able to get there, he held him from advancing. Fielding up the middle for a pitcher is so important, and some guys just don't land in a position to do it. And so that, in all this day and age of shifting and all the things that go on, and certainly this is going to be a shift right here for Ryan Howard. The pitcher can really save a position or two and save himself if he can command and take away that alleyway back up the second base. 
So let's think along with Santana here and strategize with Howard. He's had a hot bat in the series. He's already homer tonight. You have first base open. He doesn't run well. And Dominic Brown's on deck. Is Santana going to go right after Ryan or is he content to walk him to set up a double play here? Well, I think always in these situations you you attack with what you think is going to get him out first And then if that doesn't work and you fall behind then you pitch around to unintentionally walk a guy and The fact that he has hit a couple home runs certainly goes into that computer in making those decisions So one down and in one up and away to Howard two balls no strikes and so now the count will indicate that they're going to probably and they are going to put him on. So they took a couple chances. He didn't bite. They didn't make the pitches. And now you occupy that base with uh, a walk. That answers the question. The Braves won't give Howard anything good to hit. And walk him and face Dominic Brown. Brown's hit to six double plays on the year for the Phillies. Believe it or not, that's their... Highest total on the club. So two on, one out. Brown the batter. Let's check in with Tom Hart. All right, Jim. Thanks. Time for our Zaxby's incredibly good play. Irvin Santana, first six starts of the season was magnificent. And I was curious how it matched up to his year with the Royals last year. The roller coaster ride was nearly exactly the same. Greatness first five. Then 0 for 5 in his next. Now, the good news is if this roller coaster ride continues, his next six in Kansas City last year, middle of the season, he was just fine. He was a 500 pitcher with an ERA under two and a 3 to 1 strikeout to walk ratio. But while this is new for all of us, seeing Santana in a Braves uniform for the first time, it's almost a replica of last season. That's a good point, Tom. And talking to the Royals people about Santana, they said at times, John, he may have been the unluckiest pitcher in the American League. Yeah, no doubt. Defense locked the run support. No doubt. He struggled with that team uh, offensively for them to score him runs. Heads up. That would have been so classic. Just missed. That was almost a dream come true. And our buddy would have seen it. Yeah. You could have been a hero tonight. I let you down once again. No. It just was hit so fast. <laughs> One ball, two strikes. And Brown takes low, two balls, and two strikes. Well, we Macedonians are known for our slow feet. <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah. Just got to get him to hit it to the right spot. And playing a little too high. Two balls, two strikes. A lot of pitches for Santana tonight, and that's also something the Braves did not want to see. The bullpen has been used a lot. First of all, you have the four games in Colorado, then you have the two extra inning games against the Phillies and Angels. So Irvin's got to find a way to get some quick outs here. As we told you earlier tonight, David Carpenter placed on the disabled list with a sore biceps muscle and Pedro Beato was called up from Triple A Gwinnett. Not a long distance for Triple A between the big club but sometimes that travel can make it seem like you could have taken a flight. The traffic and the rain that came down today, but a unique situation to have your Triple A. That that's got to be uh, that's got to feel good for Triple A guys to not know they're not too far away. I fly towards shallow center, and this ball is going to be caught by B.J. Upton. He calls off Justin, and there's the second out of the inning. The Browns retired, and here's Mayberry. Mayberry has popped out, and he has walked. Marlins have tied the Cubs. That's 3 3 in the fifth. Washington 4, Houston 1, home fourth at Nationals Park. Yeah, it's a dangerous game to play when you start playing the schedule game. And you look ahead, and the Braves, of course, got to go forward to Washington and Houston and Philly. But after that, they can make a move 
in July just before the All-Star break. I always think that's the toughest stretch of baseball for every team. At short, Simmons charges and flips to first in time. That's a nice job by Santana of minimizing damage. The intentional walk paid off. He's due third and the fifth, down 4-0. Georgia Power, The Home Depot, and Zaxby's Indescribably Good. Braves trailing 4 nothing, but spend the 4th of July weekend at Turner Field. Get your tickets today to see the Braves take on the Diamondbacks on Friday, July 4th through Sunday the 6th. Don't miss the best fireworks show in the Southeast for this 4th of July. Visit Braves.com slash tickets today. That slash is very important. You can't just eliminate the slash, I found out. Those kind of things in the computer are very important. I think we lead the league in slashes. Do we? Yeah, on our promos. Yeah, absolutely. Slash for everything. Fans try to find a place to cool off. Got to cool off Kyle Kendrick, too. He's leading 4 nothing. He's allowed three hits tonight. He's got Simmons, Laird, and Santana coming up for the Braves. 4 nothing. Phillies have the lead. That's Oh, he's definitely in rhythm, and we have not done enough to make that rhythm change. Not a lot of traffic, a couple two out doubles. And then a single that didn't score a run because it was hit so hard. He is just boring that ball in on the right hand hitter's hands, keeping it mid thigh and lower. He's done a very impressive job of getting the ball on the ground tonight. Five ground outs, three strikeouts, and only three hits. And that one's cut on a missed. Ruiz blocked it, picked it up between the legs, and throws a strike to first for the first out. Strikeouts. And here's Laird. He rolled out to short his first and only time up. Well, it is amazing in this game of baseball. You play so many games, you visit different parks, but some parks just feel comfortable, feel like it suits your eyes, whether it's the backstop being relatively close, or you like the mound, and then there's uh, the not so friendly places. This happens to be a friendly place for Kyle Kendrick so far. You see him pitch against the Braves. You wonder how he ever loses. And then you look at his line and see that at one point he had a 10 game losing streak. But rolling merrily along through four and a third tonight. And that's outside ball two. Well, left handers have beat him up this year. I mean, they've had a higher average, a 333 average, and right handers hitting about 113 points less. So the left handers certainly would have an advantage. And 
given the opportunity. We need to get some runners on with the left hander at the plate. As I mentioned earlier, all three Atlanta hits have come with two outs tonight. Freeman doubled in the first. Hayward doubled, BJ up and singled in the third. Since then, Kendrick set down five straight. He got the 3 0 pitch over the inside corner. That missed inside. Jared Laird's aboard with a one out walk. And we'll see if Santana can move him along. Fifth. One more game with the Phillies here tomorrow, then we'll be joining Matt Coney and our friends at Delta Airlines. They are, as you know, proud sponsors of the Atlanta Braves. I'm sure Mac and his lovely daughter Melissa are watching the game tonight. Mac busily folding the little hand towels for the traveling party tomorrow afternoon before we make our way up to Washington for a game series with the Nationals Thursday night. Santana with the bunt. Williams with the peg to first. Laird in safely at second. And now the top of the order comes up with sacrifice. Because the score is the way it is, I think Ruiz could have taken a chance and thrown out Laird. He might have had him, but he took the sure out at first. Santana did his job and probably can give the Braves one more inning. But that one more inning is better than not. Having gone five, six would be helpful at the pitch count that he has. Jason has four hits in his last 18 at bats. He's been on base now 33 of his last 36 games. Dates back to May the 9th. Oh boy, did that ball move into dangerous territory for Hayward? Was foul it off 0 and 2. Well, they got a strike on the first pitch, expanded away. They've gone in, they've tried everything to make Hayward uncomfortable. I think the opportunistic thing would be to expand the strike zone away and see how much you can bite off. 0 2, you get the luxury of doing a lot of different things. Here comes the 0 2 for Jason. Ooh. Exactly where you had to go. That's a perfect pitch. You run the risk of nothing when that happens. You can only get the benefit of a call, and the umpire stays on this backdoor kind of cutter, and it's off the plate. Good discipline by Hayward. Good choice by Ruiz. Now you can go in if you want. Looks like they want to. He missed his spot and paid the price. They got a right foot up the middle. Here comes Laird around third. Mayberry's throw is off the line. Ruiz can't handle it cleanly. It's an RBI hit for Hayward, and the Braves are on the board. Isn't this a funny game? Kendrick made a perfect pitch that was called a ball and was and then wanted to go inside to Hayward and missed a spot by a couple of inches and gave up a rocket. Yeah, off speed pitch. And of course he had a chance to knock it down, but didn't. Not a lot of speed on the bases and another poor choice again by the center fielder. Now creating instead of just the one run 
and he ran on first. Another running runner in scoring position because of an overthrow. And good base running by Mr. Hayward. B.J. Upton singled last time up. I think it was the first pitch. And took that one for a strike. So the Braves with a rally here in the fifth. In a little trouble with two outs and running scoring position for Mr. Kendrick this year coming into the series at 293. Those are tough to give up. Two outs. You can understand giving up a couple with less than two outs, but two outs are where a pitcher needs to make those pitches, and he didn't make it there. So the Braves have Kendrick right where they want him. All four of their hits tonight have come with two outs. Ryan Sandberg, the skipper, Larry Boa, his bench coach on the right. One ball, one strike. Series in all the National League. That's high. Three and one. Wonder if Kendrick's looking over his shoulder at who's on deck. You can understand why. Freeman's next. Raise your hand. 177. Two outs for under scoring position. Actually, before two outs, they've been decent this year. 246. Ground ball to short. Rollins gloves and guns to first in time. That will retire the side. The Braves cash in a walk and a two out hit from Jason Hayward. On we go to the sixth inning. It's 4 1 Phillies. of the Atlanta Braves and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Atlanta Braves. All season long, Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. Gorgeous night in Atlanta. The thunder showers have passed through. 
And sadly, the Phillies lead the Braves again. It's 4-1 as you see our Mazda game summary after five innings of play. Kendrick has been terrific. A couple of two-run innings have sunk Irvin Santana tonight. Two runs in the first on the Howard Homer. Passed ball and a one-out hit by Cesar Hernandez. Plated two more for the Phillies in the fourth. Atlanta countered with a run of their own in the home fifth. And now Reed Brignac just out of reach of Simmons. It popped out of his glove and he's still down. Probably more frustrated than anything else. Bangs up the body a little bit. This is this is going to be one of the best catches that he'll make. You see his knee take out a little bit of the turf. The shortstops notoriously have smaller gloves, so that play is made even harder. And just sort of trampolined right out of the webbing. Nothing a double play won't take care of. Hernandez has been a tough out. Chase Utley's not playing tonight, and Hernandez has filled in terrifically for the Phillies. He's two for two. Pretty good speed, so a tough double play to boot. Having a nice year before he got called up. At number 300. And that's really what we talked about earlier. Where are the players going to be? Are they going to? Go from young and, and rebuild, and if this team if this team doesn't go in the direction in the next month, a lot of tough decisions for a team that has relied on high payroll veteran guys. They're hoping that could still produce at a top level. Well, how tough a decision must that be for Ruben Amaro? Here you have, as you said, this great core of the Phillies that was winning divisions, going to the World Series, won a World Series. Dealing with injuries the last couple of years in the case of Howard and Utley. And as Hernandez is down on strikes, there's a big first out for Santana with pitcher coming up. I would think as players, you always want your front office to give you a chance to win another championship. Yeah, but you got to produce a little bit more than they have to maybe even think about adding a piece. And here's that slider that went down that Santana was really known for most of the year. Kendrick with a bunt. Freeman will flip the first on the sacrifice and bring out the second with two outs for Jimmy Rollins. So the three four sacrifice works in the top of the order coming up for the Phillies and time for us to answer our AT&T Universe TV trivia question. Well, we're going to ask and we're going to answer because I feel that confident John that we're going to just nail this question tonight. It's 2001. Jimmy Rollins is one of two players to record 150 steals and 200 or more homers in the National League. Who's the other player to do that? Only two players. 200 or more homers, 150 or more steals. Hmm. See, that's kind of a question that's a little bit of a trick question. Because it says it's current player, it doesn't mean that all those numbers occurred in the National League. Could be a former American League player who's now playing in our league. One ball, no strikes for Rollins, who's doubled and scored tonight, and he didn't stop his swing. I'm just I'm I'm, I'm throwing it out there because I'm I'm trying to compute the stats in my head. Does Rafael for call had more than 200 home runs? I'd be shocked if he did. You know, you figure you got the stolen bases covered. Yeah, so there handles the hot. He probably doesn't. Okay. Uh, David Wright. That's the other guy, uh, guy I was thinking about. 150 stolen bases. He'd have to have about 20 a year in the league. Yeah. Carlos Beltran. He's with the Yankees. Oh, it's got, it's, got, it's, got, it's got to be a National League guy. I, I, I actually was paying attention. So. I know you were. 
Swing and miss. You keep eyeing the net. That's what worries me. It's distracting. Uh, I'm getting ready to turn this game around by putting my mic on the left side. Really? Yeah. It's a trick I learned. The right side's not working, so we're going to go to the left side and start next inning. 2 2 pitch. Rollins pops it up. In the air to left. Justin Upton is there. He's got it. Jimmy Rollins skies out. We'll think about the trivia question and perhaps answer it when we come back. All help will be accepted. Here's your Delta Airlines on deck trio 4 1. Phillies lead here in the sixth inning. Tonight, where the Phillies lead the Braves in game two of our series. 4 1 is your score, entering the bottom of the sixth inning. Congratulations to Richard Hamilton of Columbus, Georgia, our 2014 Delta Day winner. Richard Hamilton and his guest will receive round trip Delta Airline tickets to anywhere Delta flies in the continental U.S., hotel accommodations, and a $250 gift card. Richard, we hope you enjoy your trip courtesy of Delta Airlines. Well, as we head to the home sixth, a man of his word, John Smoltz, has indeed switched his microphone. Yeah, I, I'm breaking a rule. You should never talk out of two sides of your mouth, but I'm actually doing that today oh. via the microphone. Freddie Freeman leads off for the Braves. He doubled his first time up and his flight out. I think I know the answer to this question, but you had to be a superstitious player. I think of all of them, you had to be the most. No, actually I wasn't. But, but, but I wasn't stupid. Meaning if something was working, I would keep it going. I didn't go out of my way like it had to be or but I'll give you a couple things that were working with that I kept doing as much as I could and then I ran out of not only grass to cut but the fact that it was no longer at home. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> I won seven straight homestand starts or something like that and I cut the grass the day that I pitched. Not push more of course. Right. And it relaxed me. So <laughs> I couldn't tell it at the time. People well they already know I'm crazy but. And then I would eat pancakes a lot. That was kind of my, my thing. But, you know, it started a little bit when you see your teammates go a little bit crazy with certain paraphernalia or clothes that, you know, you just had to put it into it. And I remember we, we had to burn a shirt. Really? Yeah, a guy's shirt was so bad and raunchy and, and holes and just barely hanging on. We had to make a decision that it was best for everybody that that shirt went away. You don't have to protect the innocent. You can name names if you want. <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember who it was, but oh. I know it was pretty funny. It, 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 he stomped it out so many different times. And finally no. gave way. Now, going back to the cutting grass story, is it true that you were on the road 
after the seven game winning streak at home that you went to play golf and you actually asked the golf course superintendent if you could cut the greens. I, I was just wanting to see if I, and I knew they wouldn't let me. I could do it at my home courses, but I tried to explain that I was a skilled of the, of the machinery. The Carl Specker <laughs> of pitching as this one's popped up toward Howard and at first base and foul ground and Justin Upton's out number two. But I've told this story before and it, it's actually pretty funny because it involved Philadelphia. I, I was searching for like pregame meals right and I was searching every pitcher. What do you do? Uh, what do you eat? What do you space apart? And somebody had told me again don't remember. Said, you know I like pitching on an empty stomach. So I took that literally on a Sunday afternoon game in Philly. I didn't eat and I came to the park you know feeling pretty good woke up. Had a no hitter going in the ninth inning. Well, after eight, I was going to pass out. Like, I literally was so hungry that I had to do something. And I ran in the clubhouse and I grabbed the first thing I saw, which was a Zagna. A Zagna? A Zagna. There wasn't many options there in the old vet. And so I crushed a Zagna, got that bolt of energy, and I felt okay. And then proceeded to go out in the ninth inning with one out and give up a hit to Lenny Dykstra. And there goes the no hitter. And I can tell you, I've never had a Zagna since. Really? Yeah, it's off. It's, it's off it. the list. So superstitious, maybe not to a fault, but I'll I'll keep things going if they're working. Just thought you'd like to know this broadcast is sponsored by Zag. <laughs> <laughs> Was yeah. Two quick outs for Kendrick here in the sixth inning, cruising along with a 4-1 lead, trying to win his seventh game against the Braves as a Philly starter. And still as the batter, figures this will be. The end of the line for Irvin Santana with a high pitch count. Pedro Beato is up, as is Luis Avilan in the Braves bullpen. La Stella to short. Allen scoops and heaves to first and in time. Three up, three down. Braves offense continues to slumber against the Phillies. They've scored two runs in 19 innings. A trail 4-1 tonight. Atlanta Braves baseball was presented by your Atlanta area Mazda dealers. With Tom Hart and John Smoltz, Chip Carey back with you at Turner Field, top of the seventh inning. It's 4 1 Phillies. End of the line for Irvin Santana. He goes six innings, eight hits, four runs, three walks, five strikeouts, and a big home run to Ryan Howard with two outs in the first inning. Braves make not one but two changes as the Phillies come up for the seventh inning. As we promised you earlier, we have our AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your photo to hashtag SouthFanPhoto for a chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast. That's brought to you by AT&T. 
There's Pedro Beato. He acquaints himself with Gerald Lair, the Braves catcher. That's one of the changes for Atlanta. The other change takes place in left field where Jordan Schaefer will replace Justin Upton. Upton has been bothered by a sore hamstring, as you know, a chance to get him out of the game today, give Schaefer some playing time, and maybe rest Justin up for the finale of the series here tomorrow at noon. So Beato versus Ruiz, Bird, and Howard for the Phillies. Foul by Ruiz. It's cold comfort for Santana of his four runs, only three of them were earned. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a horrible game. He was in really pitching ahead in the count a lot of the game, but just wasn't able to make the pitch to get the decision. Sometimes you can make those pitches behind in the count and live on the edge and get better results, but today is what you wouldn't typically want a pitcher to do. Start ahead. And work your way from that point on and, and just did not translate. Line drive by Ruiz on a two strike count. And Carlos Ruiz has done a nice job in the two spot tonight for the Phillies. He's two for four. And that's another leadoff man aboard for Philadelphia tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six of their seven leadoff men have reached via hit or walk in this game. Here's Bird. Marlin is 0 for 3. Manto <laughs> delivers a strike. Glad I got him off waivers from the Reds. That was on April the 3rd. Made 24 relief outings with Gwinnett this year, struck out 22 and 28 in the third innings. That's inside, one ball, one strike. Command can be an issue. Sliders, he'll throw some sliders when you see the fastball, kind of have some sink towards it. Up. Estella points the way for BJ Upton. He's calling for it and he's going to make the play. Upton handles for out number one. Here's Lane Howard. But Two number for Howard in the first. Braves walked him intentionally, John, in the fifth inning after the leadoff double by Ruiz. That strategy worked. No other runs came across. Yeah, I was starting to talk earlier about the schedule game, and, and certainly looking ahead, you say, oh, this stretch looks good, or that stretch is going to be tough. And the problem with that is teams change, and they go through stretches mm -hmm. where the Cubs are playing much better. And, of course, the Marlins back were hot, and now they've cooled off. And, and for the... For the Phillies, they've got a they've got an interesting stretch coming up. They go from here, play four big games with the Cardinals, who are starting to catch fire. Then they go home to play the Marlins and of course the Braves, and then they go back at the Marlins. Uh, so it, it, if there's going to be a stretch where they find a way to creep back into it and they're still in it, this is going to be that stretch that they can have to get momentum before the All-Star break. And the All-Star break is dangerous for a lot of teams. I'll explain after this pitch. Good stop by Laird. That ball bounced a foot in front of the plate. Some of the some of the guys start looking forward to that break, right? And it, you can let some games slip a slip away. I always felt that the first as we look at this stop here by Laird. I always felt that the four games before and after the break are huge. Some teams come out of the gate, do well. Some teams, you know, use that time to to maximize because it can be a little bit of a lull. The break is needed. It's needed for everybody. And some guys don't get the full break. They go to the All-Star game. It's a great part of baseball to be part of. But 
So we're, we're reaching that point where look at the standings, look at the games, and look at the, that stretch just before the All Star break and just after the All Star break. Ball one strike. So Ryan Howard. Braves have a shift on. As Beato misses outside, it's two and one. Braves are hoping that it will be a well attended All Star game. Several of their players in uniform. We know Freddy Gonzalez is going. He was named to the National League's coaching staff by Mike Matheny. He and Clint Hurdle will be the National League coaching representatives along with Mike's staff with St. Louis. You guys haven't been to Target Field, have you? We were there. Um, so interleague, you did go over there. Yeah, four or five years ago. Um, so right when it probably opened, it's a it's a really nice stadium. It's beautiful. They got some unique situations that a lot of other stadiums. Um, well, something that they desperately need: big fire pit out in left field <laughs> in the pavilion. Oh, yeah, we we got almost a guided tour of the amenities of Target Field by none other than Dan Gladden. Okay, and took a lot of time to talk to our crew before the game about the Twins and Target Field, and it is truly a yeah. gorgeous state-of-the-art facility. And outside, three balls, two strikes. Of course, Big Fox will have the All-Star Game. It's July 15th. I'm going to be there participating in something pretty cool. Uh, they asked me to be in the uh, celebrity all-star uh, all softball game. Really? Yeah, I'll be against. Howard smacks one to center. B.J. Upton on the run. Feels for the fence. Has play of room. And Howard is retired. That's the second out of the inning. It's going to be uh, kind of the theme of Jack Morris and myself. Not a reunion per se, but we're both going to be opposite pitchers that, of course, in the history of the Game 7 in the World Series between us in 91. So that'll be neat. You know, partake in a, another function where we'll talk about that scenario. So I'd much rather play center field, but I understand I can toss it up there from from the pitcher's mound. Now, please tell me that Kent Herbeck and Ron Gant aren't going to get together in this space. <laughs> a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I think we were together. We're still pitching for the Braves when Atlanta played the Twins in interleague play, and yeah. I think that was the first time you had seen Jack Morris since that yeah, incredible game in the World Series. Yeah, I was in the bullpen at the time, and reason reason I remember that is we I think we had 17 inning game that we played there, and I warmed up seven or eight times and never got in the game. Uh, being on the road as the closer, you're always going to be getting ready to go in the game if your team takes the lead. But yeah, we had never really spoken. For obvious reasons, I was still playing, and then he was finishing up his career. And, and what a unique opportunity to really speak to the guy. And, and we had a chance to do on the MLB Network to get one of the greatest games set, set situation where we talked over that game. It was the first time we had really sat down and gone through it. I pop. Dominic Brown, middle of the infield. Who wants this? Hamilton Simmons, right behind the pitcher's mound, makes the play. And Pedro Beato has a nice seventh inning for Atlanta. He surrenders the leadoff hit and nothing else.
Bulls rock. Great clips of the game tonight. Need a few more for Atlanta. John down four to one at the seventh inning stretch versus Kyle Kendrick, who's up for his old tricks here at Turner Field. Yeah, definitely. And of course, playing those extra inning games, he's been able to give them a little bit more depth and rest their bullpen. But if you can just put and string some hits together before two outs, maybe the stress of that will cause the sinker to be a little bit flatter. Johnson, Simmons, and Laird are scheduled for Atlanta. Jordan Schaefer batting in the ninth spot is due fourth. And Kendrick missed low. Let's see, Chris Johnson has a new pair of batting gloves on. Last ones he wore huh, were ripped off. Oh, not by somebody, but by him. He destroyed him. He rips one toward right center field. That's going to get down and roll to the fence. Johnson's got two. He's going to slam on the brakes with a leadoff double. That's his seventh hit against the Phillies this year, and a good start for the Braves. A leadoff double. Well, he did a good job of staying inside of that ball, and of course, pounds the gap. Easy double. If they misplayed it at all. Maybe he can go to third, but a much better start. With a runner in second. Now an opportunity to kind of inch closer. Third time through the lineup for Kendrick. You almost never see a National League or I mean, a major league starter go through a lineup four times anymore. And with that in mind, Kendrick in a three run game will see the Phillies bullpen start to work. Anderson Simmons holds for two with a strikeout. Antonio Pistardo is the first man up in the pen. And the right. Bird on the run. Tumbling to the ball. Pops out of his glove. And everybody's safe. A hit for Simmons the other way, and the Braves are in business. Yeah, if Marlon Bird doesn't stumble right here, but watch as he falls, that knocks the ball out. This is not the NFL. The ball can, the ground can't cause a fumble, but it can cause a hit. Might have knocked the wind out of Marlon Bird, too. And now we start entering some of those places in the game where Kyle Kendrick has had some issues with runners on first and third the, the league is hitting 636 against them runners on first and third here's our SunTrust shining moment chance for Gerald Laird to do some damage with first and third nobody out Meeting on the mound, twofold. One, give Kendrick a chance to catch his breath, and Bird as well in right, but also to give Pistardo a few more pitches. He just got up. And after Laird, you've got Schaefer and Hayward, two left-handed hitters working. So a very important sequence for Kendrick and the Phillies here, who I would assume John would gladly trade a run for a ground ball off Laird's back. No doubt. A lot of the outs that Kendrick will get will be on the ground, so that's the only thought you have as a pitcher. You're not trying to work with a lot of this without giving up the run, although that would be great. You're really trying to induce a ground ball for a catcher that doesn't have a lot of speed. And if you're Laird, you're really trying to think up in the zone, drive the ball at worst case scenario, fly ball, scores that run. More importantly, double keeps their training a move. Big crowd making some noise now as Laird digs in. Ground ball up the middle. Rollins steps on the bag, throws to first. That is exactly what the Phillies wanted. Johnson scores a second Atlanta run. No RBI on the double play. And now Jordan Schaefer will hit with two outs and the base is empty. Well, unfortunately, you did get the run in, but you lost two outs. And that's uh, what we talked about that Kyle Kendrick can do so well. And again, you got to try to find a pitch that you can drive. And that was a pitch that he executed single-wise that 
drove it into the ground instead of driving it in the air. It's four to two now for Jordan Schaefer. And he takes a strike. Forty ninth at bat for Schaefer this year. And he drives one down the left field line. That ball slicing foul. And out of play. Very good. Economic uses of the pitches per inning. Nothing in two for Jordan. And that just missed. Boy, the Phillies, Brignac and Rollins were headed for the dugout. Rollins takes his cap off. He thought that was a strike. So did the Phillies bench. And Manny Gonzalez is hearing it from the third baseline. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see if they go there again. They went away. Schaefer missed it. So just to serve for Kendrick. Good job. He minimized the damage. Got a double play ball and a strikeout. The Braves settled for one in the home seven. To dealers, John Smoltz and Chip Carey in the booth. John pinch hitting for my partner Joe Simpson, recovering from Achilles tendon surgery. Partner, hope you're doing well tonight. And Kathy, we're really, really sorry. Yeah, I. Uh, he's going to recover and obviously be able to do the broadcasting gig. I, I think it's going to help his golf game in the long run. Lord knows he needs it. Here's our Chevron probable starters for the series wrap up here tomorrow at. 12 noon in Atlanta. Roberto Hernandez for the Phillies. Aaron Harang is pitching for the Braves. And they are part of the All H staff that, uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. That has Hamels. Right. Hughes, Harang, Heron, Hudson. The old Tim Hudson. I can add one. King Felix Hernandez. Hernandez. Yeah, he's. Yeah. Well, he is now. Yeah, he is. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> I forgot to read it. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> As uh, John Mayberry goes to work for the Phillies. But Cole Hamels was awfully good last night, was he not? He was. And, and, and you know, in Toronto, I mean, Julio was great through eight. When you get off to a slow start and don't get the full company of spring training, and certainly Santana went through that because he was without a team. 
you know, sometimes you don't. And Santana, to his credit, started off on fire, and maybe he's going through a little lull right now because of that. But Cole Hamill's not starting on time and certainly is uh, living back up to what everybody expected for Cole Hamels. And he's not going anywhere. Obviously, he's your franchise pitcher, right? I think Cliff Lee might be the only one that if they had to move somebody and somebody made an offer, they couldn't refuse. And again, you're Ruben Amaro sitting and watching this Phillies club. If they win this game tonight. Phillies pick up another game in the standings against Atlanta. You see Kendrick pitching a great game tonight. You know Cliff Lee is around the corner, at least you hope. All of a sudden, one, two, and three for the Phillies is as good as anybody else's in the National League. Yeah, it's really a lot of it has to do with perception, and sometimes you're just that that close to making things turn for your season. And look, in any other year, the Phillies would be much farther back in the standings of course wild card seems like everybody's bunched together but that's why tomorrow's game can be so important for the for the Braves to stop the bleeding a little bit and not allow a team to pick up three games in the standings in your home park if they don't come back the Braves and, and win this game and it's still a very manageable game four to two but that's I think what's made the job of a major league general manager so much more difficult now. One of the many legacies that Bud Selig is going to have is the word parity. It's something that he felt was imperative to try to create as the commissioner of baseball. And he certainly has it. At one point, maybe as recently as, and I haven't run the numbers tonight, six, seven days ago, you had 25 of the 30 major league teams within five games of a playoff spot. Think about that. We're almost halfway through the season. That's unprecedented. Yeah, and I'm a little confused by that in, in the sense that I'd love to think it's all about parity. But I, I, I have a, a few feelings and I'd love to see it play out a few more times in a few more years. But I think because it's getting a little top heavy contracts, young players being pressed into action, young pitchers, and certainly not the development that we used to see, I think more guys are in the game than maybe they're ready for. And I think you have a little more balanced teams with that being the star player big contract got to produce and then you you're trying to find other pieces you're trying to find other facets of your team to complement the star studded team and, and you know I think about you know you look at what the Detroit Tigers are facing that scenario there's a team everyone thought they would run away with the league they've got the star power of their four or five core guys and then they're looking for pieces to fill in young third baseman you know they're having trouble f finding shortstop I just I, I'm trying to put my finger on it but I've never seen baseball at this point now it's good for all that you mentioned it is for the races for the team and the chances but baseball still needs some some teams having some great years they need some they need some some dominant teams as well so it's a fine balance between the two and this ball disappears into the chest or stomach or The disappearing baseball. Freeman's trying to find it. Reed Brignac's the batter with Mayberry at first after a leadoff walk. The Phillies have feasted by putting them the leadoff man on seven times in eight innings tonight. Yet they've only scored four runs. That's really good work by the Braves pitching staff of Santana and Beato tonight. Well, your points well taken. Best team in baseball right now appears to be the Giants. Yep. Oakland's a half game behind them. Oakland at one point don't have the run differential in front of me. 130 more runs than their opponents. Ridiculous. Yep. That's scoring teams by two runs a game. Milwaukee's got 42 wins. Toronto's got 41 wins in the East. And then there's only four. Fun. There's only four teams eliminated for in, in theory so far. And everybody else has a, a fighting chance for those wild card spots. Oh, and here's what I'd like to see. If, if there's one thing, and, and maybe it's not realistic, but I'd love to see the decisions that you have to make at that trade di deadline be pushed up sooner. I, I, I really? think you should have to make your most important decisions should have to take place in the offseason. And then if you're forced to have to change your team and add a piece, you know, because of the way it's set up, you can drastically change everything in one month. And that last month to me is unfair for a team who's battled their 
you-know-whats to get to that point and then have the expanded rosters and the, the amount of trades that can take place. So I would be in favor of having to make those decisions earlier, and you would see that toughness that comes into play, and you'd see less teams just give up, not give up, but basically bank on the future and just say, here. So I, it, it's probably not going to happen, but I know there's some, some, some people out there that like to see that moved up as well, and not to mention the roster for September not being where you can use 100 people. Down the stretch. 2-2 two, two pitch. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. Um, I don't know about the trade deadline. I like the idea of the deadline where it is. But I agree with you on the September call-ups. Shouldn't be able to have a 40-man roster no. in September. Maybe five more guys have healthy scratches like they do in hockey. Well, I like there's many guys with the team right. that can't all be eligible. I like the floating roster each day. Brignac on the ninth pitch of the at-bat swings and misses. He and Beato staring each other down. What was that all about? There's the strikeout. Not so sure what he might have said. <laughs> So first strikeout for Beato, runner at first, one down. And Cesar Hernandez slaps one out of play. He's had a good night, two for three with an RBI hit. Cubs four, Miami three in the seventh. Washington all over Houston. That's six one. By the way, don't count out the Astros. One of their goals was to get to 500. They start play tonight seven games under 500. Yeah, they've done a nice job, really. Hanging in there, and they've they have some different philosophies. We're going to see how it plays out from an organization standpoint. Here's another pickoff play in the dirt this time, and he <laughs> protects the runner from getting hit. More importantly, the ball getting away. Some of their position players, their young players, have come up with uh, some flair and producing up already. Excuse me. One strike for Hernandez. And a pop up left side. Long run, Chris Johnson. He will not have a play. And Hernandez 0 2. The reason I bring up the Astros, the Braves will see Houston on the next road trip. We will be in Houston on the 24th, 5th, and 6th of June. And the Astros with Jeff Lunau as their general manager, Bo Porter as their manager. It's a really impressive young offensive players who are doing some good things for them. And that's fouled at the plate by Hernandez. It's still 0 and 2. Yeah, they are by Titan, former Philly farmhand, yep. is one of them. They are by far the probably most proactive sabermetrics team out there um, in the statistical category of information of which they process. I'm a little interested to see and not in agreement of the philosophy. It doesn't matter. They didn't ask me. But their minor leagues and how they're producing pitchers and their kind of rotation of piggybacking starters, trying to figure out how many guys will develop into a frontline starter. I don't know how you find that out in four innings, but time will tell. Isn't that the great, I want to say, last frontier because there's always something new and exciting that happens in the game? As Hernandez awaits two strike pitch, I think that's one of the final frontiers in our game. Not delving into all the Tommy John stuff and so called epidemic of the elbow injuries that we're having. What is the secret to getting and developing major league pitching, and what's the most cost effective, time effective, and injury efficient, injury avoidance, and efficient way to keep a staff together at the big league level? I, I, I know you guys had the round table on MLB Network talking about that very thing. Don't know that there is a simple and easy, honest answer. Well, I'll get to that in a second. New for 2014, the Braves will host a kids' baseball clinic for children of all abilities at Turner Field Monday, June 23rd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Learn the game from Braves legends like Marquise Grissom, Brian Jordan, and Charlie Lee Brandt. To reserve a spot today, visit Braves.com slash kids clinic. Well, I know what we're doing, Chip, is not working. 
and the new philosophies in the game have to be there has to be data that input is taken from the doctors and certainly the epidemic of Tommy John. I can tell you this development and minor leagues help build the foundation for a starting pitcher for the career. Now, if damage has been done before you get them, there's not much you can do about that. And we're going to find out what that era is, as a lot of people have kind of said that's the carnival area of baseball. Carnival era mean everything's about the radar gun and how hard you can throw. So having said that, You think about Greg Maddox, for example. Nobody could have predicted in the minor leagues he was going to be a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. He pitched 19 complete games in the minor leagues. 19. You won't find, I, I don't know that you could find 19 adding it up from all of baseball to get. So that, that's gone. That development of finding out what kind of pitcher you are. The amount of innings he pitched. The pitching in and out of trouble. Preparing for the journey of seven, eight, nine innings. Now... When he comes to the big leagues, there's nothing different. He doesn't have to stress any more or less. He's prepared for that journey. Now guys that come up from the minor leagues have less innings, less prepare, preparation, and we're asking them to be, oh, by the way, very good and throw hard and give us all you got. And go seven. Right. Great. And it's not happening. I agree with that. As Chase Utley pinch hits and doesn't get it, two and two. So you never develop to, like, the Tom Glavins, Greg Maddox's, uh, those guys aren't going to get drafted and given much chance anymore. It's the guys that light up the radar gun, and all they know is full speed. They're not developing as a pitcher. They don't know how to go at 85, 90 percent. And so you're having these guys with great stuff, wowing fans and hitters. Popped up left side. Chris gives chase again, and we'll have a play. And I guess the worst thing for me is, oh, we'll just get it fixed. Set him out a year and a half. Like, the epidemic has become what has been a, a career-saving injury and surgery as we look at this fan making the play of his life or at least that's what he wants to believe and that, and that to me is what, what's bothersome because we, we don't know we're going to have to track these guys how long will their career be, be or will it be shortened because of the financial aspect too that we can't dismiss 2-2 Two -two pitch is outside Utley a full count but this used to be an injury that was having later in your career later after you have amassed the amount of innings that it would take to wear down a ligament this is happening before guys get two three four hundred innings in their belt and so now one can only ma imagine the time frames of that surgery and the length of which it lasts we'll be talking about guys who've had two and three more regularly than we ever have before that's a terrifying thought runner goes the pitch to Utley is outside ball four Deonto now two on two out for Jimmy Rollins in the eighth can't give the Phillies any more bullpen activity continues for the Braves Roger McDowell makes his way out Shea Simmons has begun to loosen in the Atlanta pen for two Phillies they've out hit the Braves tonight nine to six Urban Santana started went six gave up four runs only three of them earned eight hits including a Ryan Howard Homer. And this eighth inning continues for the Phillies with Jimmy Rollins in the on deck circle. That reminds us we got to answer the AT&T Uber's trivia question. He's one of only two with 150 or more steals and 200 or more homers in the National League. I'm going with David. You nailed it. No, you're 100% you're right, and, and I will walk home if that's not true. Please be true. <laughs> Were you a little worried? I was. Just a little faith in me? Well, no, not in you. Just in the trickery of sometimes the way the question is asked. Whew. David Wright, the answer. To the trivia tonight as Jimmy Rollins hits. And bounces one. Foul at first. By the way, not a lot of people knew it at the time. One of my, one of my greatest things would happen in St. Louis, doing a game in St. Louis. And I said, if the Braves do not come back, and rally in this game. I will walk back to the hotel. <laughs> it's 50 feet, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe 20 yards. Right. <laughs> Who was it with the pie? Was it the Pirates? Was it? Was it? Um, was it Blass or Walk? Bob Walk? It was somebody with the Pirates. Was it Jim Rooker? I can't remember who, but 
they were they were playing somebody and they said if the Pirates lose this game I'll walk back to Pittsburgh well they were in Cleveland or something playing an exhibition game he ended up having a he was a man of his word raised money for charity and walked all the way back years and years ago so it was Jim Rooker I, I I can't remember where he had to walk to or walk from, but that was one of the things that he said on the broadcast. Two balls and a strike. And now high. Three and one. And this is a big pitch right here. This game is so in the balance of reachable for the Braves to come back and win this game that this pitch right here will determine a lot of what could happen. And he lost Rollins. Three walks in the inning, two strikeouts in the inning, and Beato runs out of steam in the eighth. Carlos Ruiz is the Phillies catcher. He's also hitting second tonight. He is a terrific fastball hitter. And he's going to see a terrific fastball from Shea Simmons. He'll stride in from the Atlanta bullpen with the Phillies owning a runner at every base and a 4 2 lead tonight. Baseball action beginning with baseball night in America on Fox. The Braves will be hosted by the Washington Nationals. Then the Rangers take on Mike Trout and the Angels over on Fox Sports 1. Our MLB doubleheader begins Saturday at 7 Eastern on Fox and continues at 10 Eastern on Fox Sports 1. Shea Simmons is on in relief of Pedro Beato in the eighth inning. The Phillies earned three walks so far in the inning. And Simmons will try to take care of Ruiz and keep this game 4-2. We've seen a nice start to Shea Simmons since being called up. His fastball, as you mentioned, pretty firm. Loves his fastball. Got to get second and third pitches over a little bit in this league to continue to dominate. And got it done. Easy ground ball to short. One pitch takes care of Ruiz. And the Phillies. Good job by Simmons. Braves at the top of the order coming up in a two run game late.
for the Phillies in the top of the eighth inning. Now the Braves come up in the bottom half with the top of the order. And Atlanta has had an uncanny knack again, John, to come back and win ball games this year. That's our Academy Sports and Outdoors leaderboard. Yeah, they sure have, and some of those were also close to being even greater comeback wins as their rallies fell a couple times short recently. So Kyle Kendrick is done for the Phillies. Jake Diekman is on for the 33rd time for the Phillies. And this Philadelphia bullpen last two weeks has been terrific. ERA of 139 collectively. Bad bullpen work first month, John. Real good bullpen work for the last month plus. Yeah, this guy's a little bit funky and unorthodox. He's got a chance to be pretty good, but you watch this warm up pitch and uh, whoops. <laughs> he hit the ball. Yeah, he throws across his body. Firm, firm fastball. Long arm delivery with a little bit of a hitch. Slider sweeps against left handers. Left handers have a hard time, I would think, picking the ball up off this guy because he comes right at him and has the makeup and the ability to mix and match his fastball and slider. So I think trending upwards, this guy had a, has a chance to be a pretty good pitcher for the Phillies out of the pen. Dickman's out of Wymore, Nebraska, a 30th round pick back in 2007. First one to Hayward is off the plate, one ball, no strikes. Now obviously the downside with the mechanics that he has is that control is going to be somewhat of an issue and being able to command the pitch, no matter how hard you throw, you gotta be able to put it in the directed area. Like that, that's gonna be tip your hat if he throws two more like that. Yeah, 96 on the corner, outside the left hand hitter, that'll work. And then he'll throw in a slider, whether it's here or with two strikes, it makes it even more difficult to track the ball. Swing by Hayward back to the screen, a ball and two strikes. So now, if I'm thinking along with Ruiz, I want to do the same thing but sweep a slider on that same plane, make it look like a fastball, but then get it out of the strike zone because he's already attacked a fastball out in that corner after he painted a strike. He put down the slider, and that was the game plan they're going with. I don't know if. They'll change it, but that's really what certain situations that you, you know, if you're thinking like a hitter on what a pitchers might do, now you're in kind of defend mode. You're, you're trying to fight off anything. You can't really sit. It's hard to sit with two strikes on something. But that not being anywhere close did nothing. Wasted pitch, right? See if they don't try to come back and make that pitch, even though it was so bad. I don't know what selection they'll go with. Get right back with it. Hayward didn't get it, and he's out number one. A two for four night for Hayward. And that's how the Atlanta eight starts. Here's BJ. Now, a little different for the right handers. They're going to actually be able to track the ball or stay on his. Delivery a little bit more from a right hander. They get to see that arm action play better for their eyes than a left hander would. Third base side of the rubber, so that means glove side is going to be a little bit easier for him to command that side of the plate. Oh! Big crowd tonight for Greg Maddox bobblehead night. 41,631. And only the first 20 got him. First 20,000? Correct. Oh! I don't know reframing on what I wanted to say. That's the first time I've reserved, reserved some judgment here. I'm my pal, Greg Maddox. Like I said to Joe Simpson last night, don't let the FCC stop you. No balls, two strikes. The pitch. Oh, just missed the inside corner. Get another look at the pitch tracks. This is going to be off the plate on the inside part. Good call. Optum strokes one to center. Mayberry back. Got it. 
two out. Freddie Freeman doubled on the first pitch he saw tonight. He's also flagged the right and struck out. things that we talked about I also think contributed to some of the parody if you will and the fact that bullpens now are being constructed differently there's so many great arms out there if they don't work as a prototypical starter they throw them in the pen and go get them for an inning I also think that's why games are taking longer because we're having an average of close to eight pitchers per game combined in baseball and the fact that the teams will shuffle the deck if you will with bullpens more so than ever before. That's why closers are bouncing around. And there's a thought, especially in some camps, that anybody can close. I disagree with that. I don't think you're going to find that trend continue. That's why Kimbrell, I think, has the longest tenure with one team in the league today. Think about that. That's amazing. As a closer. That is amazing. I'm with you. Anybody can close, anybody would. Yeah. Full count pitch coming to Freddie Freeman. Well, he's held the Braves to one run in 13 innings last night. They've held them to two through seven and two thirds tonight. And it's foul past first. If this score holds and the Washington score holds, the Braves will flip flop spots in the East. Washington a half game back. The Nationals are clobbering Houston. That's a 6 1 score. Washington trying to snap a four game losing streak. They had a great road trip going for Tim Hudson beat him in San Francisco and then went to St. Louis and got swept. Well, they ran into some hot pitchers and that's uh, that's the streaks of baseball again talking about the schedule when some teams catch fire you catch them at the wrong time. I have a feeling St. Louis is on the brink of of really rattling off a, a 15 out of 20 stretch and the arms that they are throwing out there and the, it's been uh, the, the reason they're the defending NL champs. This they skipped Adam Wainwright and tender elbow. It's not considered serious, but obviously something they're concerned about. As Freeman chased a high fastball and Deakman struck out two in his eighth inning of relief. Four two Phillies. We head to the ninth inning in game two.
trip to Washington, Houston, and Philadelphia. The Braves are home for a series with the Mets and then the Arizona Diamondbacks. And John, that takes us to the 4th of July weekend. We invite you to get your tickets for the Braves Diamondback series. The 4th of July is a Friday night in Atlanta. Game Saturday and Sunday as well. Don't miss the best fireworks show in the Southeast for this 4th of July. Get your holiday tickets at Braves.com slash tickets today. They're going to be here this week, that weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they can do some games. Great. Looking forward to seeing Martin Prado come back to Atlanta with Arizona over the holiday. As you see, Luis Avilan on to pitch for the Braves. He worked the ninth inning last night. Two thirds of one hit relief. He's got Marlon Bird. Howard and Brown coming up for his pitch swing deep short Simmons stumbled lost his footing throw off target Freeman hustles over to the tarp to make the play and it will have no throw for Anderson Simmons is real lucky he's just so quick he's really lucky he didn't roll his ankle on that play watch the turf and the foot give way right there yeah that that is just a man who has unbelievable range and arm strength. That's the only reason he could even come close to making this play. We've seen him throw the ball from a slipped position. Had some rain a little bit today, and of course that's where he dumped some of the, the water off the tarp. And so a hit and an error for. Marlon Bird, who stands at second base, Ryan Howard, the batter. Jonathan Papelbon has gotten up for the Phillies in their bullpen. Right now, the lead with which he would play is two. Howard tries to change that here. 10 o'clock in Atlanta, 4 2 in the ninth. The Phillies have the lead again. Swing and a miss. He got the game off to a roaring start for the Phillies way back in the first. Pitch up and away, and he went with it. I still can't believe his splits. I, I just, it, I would swear that's got to be a misprint. Home road thing? Oh my gosh. Yeah. How do you figure the Phillies are hitting 229 in their home? I, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't know how that could all of a sudden change with a park that just seems to be built for especially Ryan Howard I mean, he's hit 189 at home as compared to 272 on the road hitting has never been a problem for this Philly slugger in Atlanta there are the splits John is talking about 90 point difference in average everything else pretty similar Two balls and a strike. Seems to me too, John. This has been in many ways for a lot of clubs the year of the splits. You know about Colorado. Yeah. And their home road splits. Justin Upton. Great hitter at home. Not nearly as damaging away from Turner Field for the Braves. As an example. Three balls and a strike. A pitch for Kemp. And then there's the guys like Chase Utley. You can't find any really. He just is pretty consistent, and everything's pretty normal when he talks about the splits. But sometimes it works in a way where you just scratch your head and go, "Hmm, I, I just don't know that that can continue. That trend can continue." Three, two is taken inside by Howard. Braves bullpen starting to walk too many people. That's four walks from Beato and Avilon now. And first and second for the Phillies, none out. Yeah, this is a pretty good pitch when we first saw it, but of course, just just a hair inside. And, and I know you guys have watched a little bit more on an everyday basis, but it, is it my imagination or does Avalon, in the last couple of times he's been pitching, trying to lower his arm angle to create more sink, or is it just something that uh, he's making an adjustment? Because I have noticed both yesterday and today when he wants to, especially a left hander, he's, he's dropping his arm to. An angle to maybe locate the pitch better, but he's got such a heavy sinker, and maybe he's trying to help it a little bit more. And there's goes through times where 
as a pitcher, you, you try to help it more than naturally comes out of your hand. Tom. Yeah, guys, David Carpenter being away from this team for two weeks will really put a hole in the bullpen, and he told us today that he knows he's put his guys in a bad spot. See 91 on the board, I, you know, it's not going to look very good. But um, it, it's just kind of tough, you know, especially seeing how hard some of these guys are playing. You see Gat, you see, you know, um, Gerald busting their butt out there every day, you know, at a tough position. And all we're required to do is go out and throw a ball. You know, you want to be reliable, you want to be dependable, so you want to go out there and take the ball as many times as you can. And after the stolen base by Bird, Carpenter was referring to the drop in velocity last night when his biceps started acting up on him. He told assistant athletic trader Jim Lovell that he was having bicep issues before he went back to the mound. Then his fastball that's usually in the upper 90s came in at 91. So with that, David Carpenter to the DL. Beato up from AAA. And a stolen base has Philly runners at the corners now with nobody out for Dominic Brown. I'll tell you, Marlon Bird picked a perfect time to actually take off after a pitching visit in the mound and focusing on the hitter. Avalon just lost all track and awareness that he was on second. Ground ball to short. Bam! Simmons can't corral it, and all hands are safe. Bird will score a fifth Philly run. What in the world happened on this play to short for Simmons? Well, I guarantee you this hit a heel mark or something and just took off the wrong way. That was a play he'll make almost every day, and the ball just took a bad hop and took almost off. You're anticipating that ball to have a certain height to it so that you can turn a double play, and when that ball keeps going up, you've already set your hands, and that late adjustment was not in time. That has scored a fielder's oh. choice, which allows Brown to reach first. E6 on Simmons allows Howard to take second. Word on Justin Upton, it wasn't the hamstring, but he was feeling dizzy and lightheaded tonight. That's why he left the ball game for the Braves. Hopefully he'll be good to go in the series wrap up tomorrow. So John, one of the subjects that we talked about tonight was the Braves bullpen, heavy workload. They've had to cover up three innings tonight. They have walked four men. They've allowed a couple of hits and an all important fifth Philadelphia run. And it changes the strategy for Freddie. You can't go to the guys that typically in a close game you would go to and you know, Beato was brought up here to eat up some innings because he was probably the most fresh as their roster uh, for Gwinnett. And the fact that the score always indicates how you use your bullpen, the Braves are a little bit limited and having to make do with really the late inning heroics that ended up going deeper into the games. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but sometimes. You know, if you can win those games, it's worth it. Uh, certainly when you lose, it has a worse taste and a cumulative effect because now you've exhausted your bullpen. Sometimes when you lose that game one to nothing, you tip your hat and you go, okay. Um, everybody wants to win every game they put a uniform on. But when you go through these kind of stretches, you need starters to pick them up. You need them to take the ball the next day and go, I don't need you guys today. That mindset says, I'm taking the ball and I know that I need to pitch eight innings. To help everybody out. It didn't work today for Santana. This is the 12th consecutive game for the Braves in a stretch of 17 straight. And while that doesn't sound all that taxing, it truly has been in another way. First the pitch, which Mayberry skies towards center, and that's playable for BJ Upton. And there's the first out. That's why I, I, I keep echoing. I think the trend that baseball's on is a dangerous trend. I really do. I, I think when you have to when you have to finish every game with your bullpen over 162 games that yeah. I don't know how many guys can last that and the appearances and the amount of up and down. So I think the, the underappreciated complete games got to come back sooner or later because otherwise you got to go to a six man rotate. I don't know what they're going to do, but there's not enough great arms to cover 
that many innings out of the bullpen and rarely do you see teams win and win it all when their bullpen's leading in the in the innings pitch category rarely oftentimes it means the starter wasn't real good yeah the starters weren't all that good that wasn't necessarily the case tonight Santana okay I, mean, I think is the way yeah you describe yeah. it three runs in his six innings but right now this is a weary Braves ball club they went to Arizona and Colorado they've come home with the Angels the Sunday night game and then back to back ball games with Phillies a couple of extra inning games thrown in for good measure. But this a tired time for Atlanta making no excuses but the fact of the matter is you play the schedule you're dealt. Getting back to May 12th the Braves have been on the road an awful lot. And really it's the timing of it. It's not like this has been all year. The starters have been great. They've uh, especially early on eaten up a lot of innings. It's the timing of the stretch run you're in. If this was spaced out a little bit it's no big deal. I mean you can handle this but when you have this many games in a row where you've extended the game and pitched well beyond nine. It, it has its accumulative effect. One one pitch she is bounced back to the mound. Avilon two Simmons for one. Flip to first in time. Bunyak's double up. And Luis gets out of the ninth inning with only one run across. But it's a big run for the Phillies. They extend their lead to five to two. And Jonathan Papelbon staring you in the face from the mound here at Turner Field. Phillies about hit the Braves 10 6 to Atlanta errors. One of them costly in the top of this ninth inning. We wrap up the series here tomorrow. Early start, quick turnaround for the Braves. It's game three of the series. Roberto Hernandez will pitch for the Phillies. Aaron Harang will hit the ball for the Braves. We hope you'll join us tomorrow with Braves live at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Then John and I will. Tell you all about game three of this series between the Braves and the Phillies. All that's left to be decided tonight, John, is whether this will be a chance to win the series outright or for Atlanta to avoid the sweep. Yeah, exactly. Come back against this guy. Yeah, and to finish that thought with the bullpen, the Braves are the third best team in baseball with innings pitch. So don't mislead the fact that we're not suggesting it's overwork. It's just it's a bunch in a few, few short days. And Philly actually has been real good in their bullpen. I mean, they're 14 and 10, and they're probably fifth best with innings pitch. So it still revolves around the starters. And then the end of the game, of course, if you have a lockdown closer like Jonathan Papelbon, you feel real good in these type of situations, especially with a three-run lead. Ryan Domit leads off for Atlanta. He bats for Avilon and Tommy Listella. Applebaum had an impressive 15 consecutive saves string broken last night. The blue hit by Anderson Simmons tied the game at one and took away a chance for Cole Hamels to win his third of the season. Rip to right. Bird. Hamels.
hangs on this time as he went to the turf in right. One out. Real good swing. And this time he has his balance throughout the play and he can go into that slide which allows him to cushion the ball into the glove instead of falling onto the ground. I meant to ask you this earlier tonight. This is a perfect time to do it. You've looked at life from both sides of the equation that Jonathan Papelbon took part in last night. You've been a starter who's seen a great eight inning performance blown by a blown save. You've also gone out there and had a rough ninth inning and lost a game for that starting pitcher. I would imagine those are the most frustrating things a pitcher can experience in the major league. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting and I made that a, a quest of mine. I, I don't know if I blew one game for a starter, I, I, I fully appreciated how hard it was to work so long to get a win. Bounced off the plate by Lestella. Papelbon. That's the flip from Howard and in time. Two out. And the point is, you, you, you recognize that and you grind in a, in a game like last night. There wasn't much he could do, some hits that fell. And it, it is frustrating, but uh, over the course of time, Jonathan Pepperline, as we see this play, pretty good athlete. He loves tension, almost loves chaos. And when people start questioning him and whether he's still got it, he rattled off 15 in a row. And I wouldn't be surprised. Unfortunately, at the expense of the Braves, he doesn't start another stretch. But this guy is one of the prototypical great closers of the game that doesn't get enough credit because he likes to say certain things that may be a little controversial at times and create something when there isn't something there. And I think he feeds off of it. One of 26 men to save 300 games in the big leagues. So what does a guy like Papelbon say to Cole Hamels? After the game last night, you know, you just basically go up and say, man, my bad. I, you know, it wasn't because of a lack of effort. It wasn't because I walked guys. It was, you don't have to say a whole lot. Cole Hamels has been there and understands the way the game goes and the certain hits that took place in that ninth inning to tie it. But I'll tell you what's more impressive for me when a closer blows a game to keep that game going, to give your team a chance to win. It was exactly what Philadelphia did and won it in the 13th inning. It would have been real easy to get your dauber down and just give up one more hit and the next thing you know you're dealing with a loss. So he was able to keep the game going when it was first and second I think with one out something like that in the ninth. Johnson a liner to third and Reed Brignac leaps to make the grab and Jonathan Papelbon saves game two of the series. Kyle Kendrick beats the Braves again. 5-2 your final score in Atlanta. We're back to wrap it up after this.